Just some exciting scenes from our past nine seasons, one of our nine seasons of black college football and BET very, very uh, excited about the kickoff of our 1989 season, which will get underway next Saturday. We'll kick it off down in Mobile, Alabama. We'll tell you more about our schedule as we go along in the program. But one of the things I wanted to say is that one thing that we at BET Sports uh, have great respect for are the sports information directors at the member institutions in which we cover throughout the football and basketball seasons and also the conference sports information directors you know we can be very demanding at times we're on the phone with them on Mondays just before their games and sometimes we we make special requests that are not always done with a smile and they always come up we we need statistics we need numbers we need numerical rosters we need all kinds of things and the people that you see sit at seated here with us today are just a small portion of the group that makes everything work for us because without these people, uh, the sports information directors and the conference SIDs, our job would not be an easy one. And I just want to take my hats off to your, uh, you and to the people of your member institutions and your conferences because sometimes we do ask a lot. We request coaches interviews and we want shots of players and coaches, they get up tight before games and things like that and they try to, they're in the middle because we want certain things and uh, they try to get them and the coaches are yelling back at them and saying no you can't have them and we, we're saying but well, we need this and we need that and and they know what we go through we know what they go through and again we'd like to thank you a little bit uh, for those of you who do not know what sports information directors do they're basically the PR people for the conferences and for the particular teams and I want to start off with Russell Stockard not because he's a senior member here but because he <laughs> I, the reason is because he's representing the Southwestern Athletic Conference and the Southwestern Athletic Conference has produced the last two Super Bowl MVPs of course there was Doug Williams year before last and last year Jerry Rice and that has to make the conference feel very very proud Russell yes uh, Charlie we are very proud of that fact and we hope that we can have a third most valuable player in next year's Super Bowl but this year will be another very exciting football race uh, Jackson State is again the rabbit uh, the rabbit because they've won 25 consecutive conference games and they've been the conference champions for the last uh, five years uh, two of those years they were tied uh, Jackson State returns a very outstanding uh, football team, and W.C. Going, his coach, uh, promises to make it interesting for the other seven members of the conference. Um, although Jackson State lost uh, one of the outstanding running backs in the country last year in, in Tillman, uh, they return their quarterback, uh, they return outstanding receivers, and uh, they return over 10 linemen that weigh more than 300 pounds. I might add that eight, D, of, yeah. eight of these linemen, <laughs> eight of these linemen are offensive linemen, mind you. Uh, but Jackson State has an outstanding team. They have uh, a, an array of linebackers that will be again in the Jackson State mold. Uh, Darren Connor is uh, the outstanding linebacker that is expected to go in the first round next year. Uh, this team also has uh, a junior quarterback by the name of Sean Gregory, who last year led them to a conference championship. So Jackson State will be the team that the other seven teams in the conference will have to catch and, and dethrone. Well, you know, you talk about Jackson State. They, they have, what, four, four straight years yes. won the Southwestern Athletic Conference. And let's take a uh, look, if we can. We have the records of these teams from a year ago. Now, of course, Jackson State won it all. They were 7-0 and in conference play. And then they were 8-1 and 2, in fact, uh, in overall standings. And those two ties came against, of course, non-conference opponents. Grambling, 8-3 overall, but they were 5-2. And they've struggled a little bit in the conference. We'll talk about Grambling in a minute and see what's happening with Eddie Robinson. Alabama State, 7-3-0. And, uh, and uh, they were 4-3 and in the conference and tied with Alcorn with the conference record. Alcorn, 6-4 uh, and four overall, 4-3 four and three in the conference, as was Southern. So you had three teams in the conference with 4-3 and three records. You had Alabama State, Alcorn, and Southern. Uh, Prairie View was 3-4, and 5-5 four, five and five overall. They finished at 500, while Mississippi Valley, 1-6 and 3-8 and and overall, while Texas Southern failed to win 
a game, and they made some coaching changes down at Texas Southern. In fact, you've had two coaching changes in the conference. Before we get into that, let's quickly talk about uh, the Grambling situation. You know, there was a lot of talk in the offseason, and of course, there's always talk from outside people, alumni, boosters, and things like that, that Eddie Robinson should step down. Uh, they have lost the last two Bayou Classics, and of course the prerequisite a lot of times for keeping a job at Southern is winning the Bayou Classic and beating Grambling in the Bayou Classic, but they've lost the last two Bayou Classic. They lost a game to Howard University uh, in the Meadowlands, and that, that didn't sit well with a lot of the alumni and a lot of the people when they were talking about Eddie stepping down. His role has changed somewhat, not on the football field, but in the athletic department. He is no longer the athletic director at, at Grambling, and now he can devote all of his time to football. Well, that's true, Charlie. Uh, Eddie is only the football head football coach at Grambling State University. However, uh, I don't think that that will in any way prevent Eddie from making a very strong run at Howard University. Uh, in fact, I think he'll, he'll devote, have more time to devote to football now. Um, he's been at Grambling for 49 years. He's been the uh, head coach for 48 of those 49, one year during the World War II. They did not have a football team. But uh, Grambling has all the ingredients to make a very, very strong run at, at, How at uh, Jackson State University because uh, they have an outstanding quarterback in Clemente Gordon, who was the all-conference quarterback uh, first team last year. They have a young man by the name of Fred Jones, uh, which is, uh, who is one of the outstanding uh, talented running backs and receivers. And they always have terms. good wing backs, though. Yes, they? Yeah. Uh, from the Trumaine Johnson, right. the Dwight Scales, mm -hmm. uh, the Sammy White mm -hmm. mold. He is of this particular mold, and uh, he will make uh, Grammar's offense go. Uh, Gremlin has a defense that would be typically Gremlin, big, mobile, and I suppose mean. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, I think Gremlin has a chance to at least tie Jackson State this year. Mm -hmm. However, uh, there's one team that very few of us are thinking about this year that, that uh, may very well uh, be the team to push Jackson State, and that's Alabama State. Mm -hmm. They have a, 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 a very good, young, uh, hungry team that is returning and uh, with their second year coach, uh, coach uh, Houston Markham, mm -hmm. they've made great strides. It's going to be a very interesting season, but don't forget Alcorn State and uh, although Southern is picked to finish fifth by the coaches, uh, it, it may not be quite that way. It's going to be another interesting race in the SWAC and uh, there are a lot of outstanding ball players. I haven't forgotten the rest of you, but we're, we're on a roll here. I just want to want to want to talk about. You talked about Clemente Gordon at uh, Grambling. We talked about uh, Darian Connor at Jackson State. They've lost Tillman, of course. Then there's a the young man who was a freshman a year at Mississippi Valley, Humphrey. Yes. Uh, he should have a, a pretty good year this year. Of course, Alabama State is a team maybe to be reckoned with. And here's a kid named Jones who came out of Jackson, Mississippi. Markham man managed to recruit him over at Alabama State who may be the kid uh, that you want to look out for. He was a freshman last year, kind of thrown into the fire, and had did a very good job. And then, of course, he has a defensive back who was an all-conference uh, teammate uh, last year in uh, Mark Hurt. Yeah. So you've got uh, two good players. Here's Mark Hurt, a shot of Mark Hurt. Let's talk a little bit about Hurt. Well, Hurt was an outstanding uh, defensive player last year. He was also an outstanding punt returner. Mm -hmm. And uh, this makes him a very valuable uh, member of the Alabama State team. Now, you mentioned um, Ricky ja Jones, who mm -hmm. was a quarterback at Alabama State, and he had a very successful season last year. Uh, if Alabama State is going to make its run this year, it will have to be done with Ricky Jones as its leader. Uh, but Alabama State uh, will have the Jackson State type defense, mm -hmm. and this is the thing that's going to really propel them, that defense. Okay, thank you very much, Russell Stockard. Mm -hmm. We're with the SIDs from the respective four majority black conferences in our nation, and we're talking about our preview on the upcoming 1989 football season right here on BET. We'll be back with more and the rest of the SIDs in just a moment. Stay with us.
Welcome back to a special edition of the Budweiser Sports Report as we continue our Black College preview show for 1989. Jim Alnudi is representing the SIAC, and uh, that's quite a wide open conference then. A lot of fireworks are happening uh, right now. Of course, you had uh, Bill Davis, who was a coach at Savannah State, was the coach of the year, even though they did not win the conference championship last year, but they have an exciting football team, and you're looking for big things from them this year, aren't you? Yes, we are. Uh, Bill was selected by his peers. Mm -hmm. uh, the head coaches select the coach of the year. Uh, this past year, we brought all the coaches together to Atlanta, and we selected the all-conference team, and uh, Bill was honored that way. Bill won it his first year there, and then he won it this year, so he's won it two out of three years. But uh, the conference this year is, is going to be rough because uh, Albany State never rebuilds. Mm -hmm. They, they reload. just reload. <laughs> uh, Alabama A&M is going to be there with their defense. And those were the top two teams in the conference right. last year, right? Right, and Savannah. Right, and then Savannah And then started. Savannah. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you talk about Savannah, you've got to talk about Shannon Sharp. Right. You've got to talk about Richard Bates. Uh, when you talk about um, uh, Albany State, you've got to talk about the freshman sensation last year. Yeah. Let's go through this, the standings from 1988 real quickly. We saw mm -hmm. the top two, Alabama, uh, Albany State and Alabama uh, A&M, and then Savannah State, then followed by Fort Valley, and then Tuskegee, three and four. But I thought they were a better team than their three and four record indicated. And three and six overall. That's conference three and four, three and six overall. <clears throat> well, they lost a lot of players mm -hmm. right at the beginning of the season. Right. Um, and uh, the academic problem, uh, problem mm -hmm. hurt them. Uh, they will be back. Uh, this year, Albany State's, you know, we're split in uh, East sure. and West. Mm -hmm. But Albany State's uh, been picked as the top team overall. That's what happens when you get so big, like the CIAA. <laughs> yeah. you, have, you have the North and the South and the East and the West. <laughs> well, see, when you, talk about, when you talk about CIAA and the SIAC, you're talking about the two oldest conferences in the country. So we have to provide that leadership. That's true. And, uh, and but let's talk, well, you know, and, 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 and I know everybody's laughing there. <laughs> the other SIDs are laughing at Jim. But when you talk about that, Jim, uh, you also talk about some really historically traditional black schools right. in the SIAC. Right. I mean, some schools, you have schools in all of your conferences except the SWAC that do not have football teams, but they're there, you know, uh, like St. Paul in the CIAA that doesn't have a football team. Merlin Eastern Shore in the MEAC. You have schools in your conference. Yeah, LeMoyne, Owen, and Owen. Payne College. And then you've got Lane and Miles and Knoxville, all of those colleges and, and uh, Clark, uh, Atlanta University, Mars Brown, all of those, these are traditional big names as far right. as when you talk about black schools. Yeah, we, we have uh, the premier uh, of the schools, we feel, because if you look at the SIAC, and you think about it, you think about going back when there was in that conference, Tennessee State, That's right. Jackson State, Florida A&M, Bethune-Cookman, South Carolina State. So it's always been a, a reserve for production. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the coaches there now are carrying it on. Um, we feel that there's very few coaches uh, in the country that can compare with uh, what Hampton Smith has done at Albany State. Mm -hmm. uh, we look, you have Bill Davis at Savannah State. You've got uh, Doug Porter at Fort Valley. Uh, Jim Martin has done a great job at Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim would have been in the thick of things last year if it had not been for the academic problem. I look for him to bounce back. Oh, he'll be back. Yeah, he'll be back. And, uh, you know, they've got a new coach at uh, Alabama A&M. Talk a little bit about Shannon Sharp. <laughs> Shannon Sharp. That, may, that brings a smile to my face. <laughs> Shannon, as, um, he was a player of the year, mm -hmm. his uh, sophomore year. He was the uh, uh, offensive player of the year last year. He's, he's got statistics. Um, in two years, he averaged 5.9 catches a, a game, 18 yards a catch, 105 yards a game, uh, 22 touchdowns last season. I mean, 12 touchdowns last season, 
with uh, 1,031 yards. That follows the season when he had 10 touchdowns with uh, 1,078 yards. Mm -hmm. And um, the pros are looking at him. Um, he's he may be the next Jerry Rice coming out of a black school. Yes. Well, the thing or is, or John is that, Taylor. Uh, yeah. Right. Right. You <laughs> know, leave plus, John Taylor. He's out. got a brother. That's right. That's already with Green Bay. Mm -hmm that a lot of these scouts are saying that Shannon is on an equal with him right now. So our conference, uh, the top five schools, can, can belong to anybody. Um, Fort Valley's falling off a little bit. They're in a rebuilding stage, but uh, the team that you have to beat every year Albany. is Albany State. Hampton Smith uh, found a freshman last year running back, uh, Willie Conway. Mm -hmm that uh, didn't start until the sixth or seventh game and uh, ended up with 13 touchdowns. Well, you got, he was, he's one of the 1989 preseason uh, right. all SIAC team, yeah, SIAC right, right. Uh, team, along with Curtis Bell and of course Sharp and Willie Deloach, a running back uh, right. also who's a sophomore from Savannah State. Right, well see the, the return people were both freshmen last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the all-conference team, and uh, then you know what that does. That gives you know what that does to a coach. What's that? You have gray hairs because <laughs> if he was a freshman, that means I got to watch this kid for three more three years, more years. <laughs> running at me. And you I got to get wanted, ready for it. For three more wanted Morris <laughs> Brown and, and yeah. one at Savannah. Yeah. You know, and the thing that that uh, will make really make the decision uh, for Albany State is the quarterback. They lost a great one last year, and uh, Savannah State brings back. Richard Basil. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a battle. Uh, realistically, the coaches look for Albany, Alabama, and in Savannah. Uh, the dark horse is going to be Tuskegee. How's the outlook for the conference as a whole? How strong is it? The conference is strong. Uh, the conference is real strong. I think it will show uh, in the weekly ratings uh, because we're going to have three teams up there. Um, our conference president, uh, Dr. Campbell, is doing a lot to really bring the SIAC back on the top of the heap where it, it belongs. Now you need a commissioner. We're working on that too. The now search what's committee taking is so out. long. I'm going to get on you. I mean, I'm what, not going. Well, <laughs> I'll put it this way: we will settle for nothing less than the best. Now, so, how long have you been looking for? Since June. Since June. Yeah. Okay, well, I know you would like to have one in place by the opening of football season. Ann Little is not going to get off the hook either because the CIAA is looking for a conference commissioner. And we'll be back to talk some more with our sports information directors in just a moment. We'll be right back. two relaxers, the Pearl Collection is my first choice for my family and me. The Pearl Collection, one of the world's largest beauty and hair care product lines in the world, also available in professional sizes. Stan, SIA, uh, CIAA, we talked about the SIAC, SWAC, and Little representing the uh, CIAA. Last year, Pete Richardson, first year as head coach at Winston-Salem, took him to the championship, was named coach of the year in the CIAA. A lot of people looking for him to repeat again this year. What are your thoughts, Ann? Well, he has exceptional returning talent, uh, particularly in Broderick Grays. Mm -hmm. Broderick is a running back, and he led the conference in rushing last year. Uh, coach Richardson also has an outstanding kicker, Dino Bellagrinas who broke several conference records with his performance last year. Uh, field goal and point after attempts, he was 35 of 38 with his point after touchdown, and he was 17. That's a kicker too, isn't he? Uh, or is it not? I think he wears a shoe. Oh, that's the other kid. That's the kid from uh, Virginia. Who they play in the championship? Virginia State. Virginia State. That was okay. the barefoot kicker. Right. Okay. And uh, Dino was also 17 of 23 for field goals. Mm -hmm. So both of them are assets, and... Uh, Les Barley, who is a, a linebacker out of mm -hmm. Java, Virginia, he was second in the conference last year, total tackles. So 
Coach Richardson's got a lot of artillery, and it's very possible that he could do the return. Last year, the uh, championship game was played at Winston-Salem. They were the Southern Division champs. This year, the championship game will be played at the site of the Northern Division winner, which could be the Virginia State Union, Hampton, Norfolk State, Elizabeth City. And Bowie State. Bowie State uh, is now moved. It has now moved to, to the, the northern. North. North. Finally, they Finally. figured out that Maryland was in the north <laughs> and not in the south. Well, that's that's admirable in the Seattle. Well, actually, it had, <laughs> what it what it had to do with was uh, the date that Bowie entered the conference, okay. and the at that time there was a different number of football playing schools. Mm -hmm. So Bowie was put into the south because there was an imbalance in the south. Let's look back over last year's statistics as far as the one loss record. This conference is split into uh, two divisions, the North and the South. Uh, in the Northern Division, Virginia State basically in the overall standings finished in a, uh, with a 7-4 and four record while Virginia Union finished 7-2 and two, and Hampton was 7-3. and three. But in the uh, conference, Virginia State was 5-1, and one, Union 4-2, and two, and Hampton 3-3. Three and three. Norfolk State was 5-5 five and five overall and two and four in the conference while elizabeth city was two seven and one one four and one in the conference then the southern division southern division won by winston-salem they had the best record of any team in the conference overall that was ten and two their uh, conference record equaled uh, virginia state they were five and one they had a couple good battles there along the way these uh, two schools uh, of course north carolina central finished second they lost their all-conference quarterback. We'll talk about that a little bit, and we'll see how they will be able to bounce back after uh, after that loss. Nine and two, nine two and one, and then four one and one in the conference. Bowie State was a surprise team last year in the conference. They finished nine one and one. In fact, they went to the postseason playoffs. They had to go all the way to Portland State, uh, ironically, to play. But uh, the fact that they made it, Bowie had been the, the like the doormat of the conference for so long, and then to come back and, and have such a fantastic year. And then after they do, they lose their coach. So, right. you, you know, a, a lot of things have happened. <coughs> but again, like you said, they've been transferred now to the Northern Division. Can they uh, repeat the magic of a year ago? Well, one thing, they do have a new coach, mm -hmm. but the new coach is assistant head coach from last year, Sanders Shiver. Mm -hmm. And I think coming, making the transition internally is going to help Coach Shiver quite a bit. The guys on the team are familiar with him, and he's familiar with the team. Mm -hmm. So I don't anticipate it being quite a tough transition. The transition should be much smoother one than a lot of other institutions. But then you have another coaching change in the conference. You have two more. Yes, we do. You had you had more than anybody this year. And and those are interesting. At Elizabeth City State, Johnny Walton is head coach. Mm -hmm. Johnny was head coach. Uh, before. He's been head coach before. He was head coach between '80 and '82. Mm -hmm. He had compiled a 20, 10, and 1 record for He's those He's a graduate of Elizabeth City, right? Yes, and he, he played is. professional football. Played for the Philadelphia yeah, Eagles. Mm -hmm. So Johnny is a member of the Elizabeth City family. And he, it's like homecoming. Right. <laughs> so it, it, there again, you may not have quite a large transition. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other change? Uh, other change, very interesting at Fayetteville State. Raymond McDougall was head basketball coach, interim head basketball coach. He had coached at Fayetteville State from 70 to 79, and he compiled a 50, 45, and 3 record. They named him football coach, so he also is making a return, mm -hmm. so it should be interesting. Well, uh, you've also changed athletic directors down at Fayetteville State. Yes, yes they have. Uh, Jeff Capel mm -hmm. has joined the Fayetteville State family. He came from Wake Forest University, and he will be athletic director and head men's basketball coach. Okay. Well, it's going to be interesting what's happening down at Fayetteville State. Let's take a look at some of your preseason coaches' picks as far as uh, all conference players. You've got Maurice Flowers, the young man out of Johnson C. Smith. Talk a little bit about him. And then you've got uh, Harry Fuller from North Carolina Central D back, and then the punter James Simpson from Livingston. Interestingly enough, the conference lost the top four quarterbacks mm -hmm. from the statistical categories last year. Maurice was in a situation where he traded off a lot with another quarterback, Mel Westmoreland. Mm -hmm. So Maurice is in a position where he's going to be the quarterback, and I think he's going to be very productive. And with those top four quarterbacks gone, well, we're open, you know, for heir apparent. <laughs> the, the role is yeah, open, yeah, and I yeah. think Maurice has the potential. I guess the guy who stood out more in anybody's mind was the man that Henry Lattimore had down in North Carolina sure. Central. Uh, yeah, Earl, James, Harvey. Earl Harvey, Earl Harvey, right. Earl Ear Harvey, uh, and he was 
you know, very exciting, an electrifying type player, a guy that you, you know, it reminds me of the, the, the situation when uh, Mississippi Valley had Totten and Rice running, working together. They, there were teams that you liked to go and cover. You'd like to see certain, like Sharp, and you'd like, to, you often, often wonder what would happen if you had a Harvey and Sharp on the same team, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> Fortunately, unfortunately, we're in different conferences, but, uh, uh, Beside that, what is going to happen to North Carolina Central this year? Will, will the loss of Air Harvey, how will it affect uh, Hank Lattimore and his squad? Well, I think that Earl was doing such a good job and Earl was breaking so many records that there were a lot of things on North Carolina Central's team that people overlooked. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, two defensive backs from North Carolina Central, Robert Massey and Gerald Mack, mm -hmm. are with professional clubs. Mm -hmm. Robert Massey was the first player chosen from a historically black Mm -hmm. in this NFL draft. Mm -hmm. So uh, Harry Fuller, as we mentioned earlier, is a returning defensive back, mm -hmm. and he is from the same location as the other two backs that I just mentioned, mm -hmm. Massey and Mac. He's from Charlotte. Mm -hmm. and they got away from Johnson C. Smith. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so uh, um, we're looking for their defense. To, to, to take really them. They've, they've been such an offensive-oriented type team over the last couple of years. Well, they have, but I think that in all of the excitement about their offense, people weren't paying a lot of ten attention, attention to, to their defense. And they had one. Yes. Let's switch gears a moment. Uh, oh, I guess it was May that you lost your commissioner who had been there for what? Uh, well, uh, effective April 30th, our commissioner of 13 years, 13 Bob years. Mormon, resigned. Left. Mm -hmm. under less than ideal conditions from what I understand you probably will not comment on it uh, a lot of people want to say that he resigned but uh, you know we, we a lot of people who were close to the situation know that he's probably forced out because he couldn't be controlled by the powers to be now the fact is that they have not been able to find a replacement as of yet they've got a young man named Kerry Leon Kerry is the business manager who's the interim commissioner will he be uh, named the commissioner well, Mr. Carey has not applied for the position on a full-time basis, and I don't particularly think that he's interested in continuing on as a full-time commissioner. He is additionally business manager, so he's carrying quite a heavy load right now. When do they plan on naming a commissioner? I mean, April 30th, this is uh, September. What are they going to do? Well, we have a search committee. And when you try to follow a gentleman who has been in office for so long, I think that our search committee is trying to take their time and make sure that they can find someone who can handle the conference as it is right now. And who will say yes to everything that they want. Well, uh, I did not read that as one of the requirements. Okay. <laughs> we'll be back with more in just a moment. Stay with us. America. I'm the premier fighter for a drug-free America. The NAACP is totally committed to fighting this drug epidemic, which is threatening all of America's youth. It won't be easy, but with your help and commitment, we can win. So join us in the fight. And if anyone ever asks you to take drugs, say absolutely, absolutely no. I think the team has done a tremendous job as far as the transition. Uh, they've been willing to work, uh, they have great attitudes, and certainly our coaching staff has been very pleased with their uh, progression in our offense and defense at this time. On the defensive side, uh, people like David Westbrook, Charles Gibbs, Gary Willingham, uh, a couple of inside linebackers that have been playing well, Kenneth Newsom and Mac Jones. Uh, we also have a, a outside linebacker, James Garland, that is a, a senior that has been playing exceptionally well for us this summer. Uh, we have a veteran defensive backfield with uh, Willie Johnson, and uh, I think that uh, those individuals will be able to be the glue for our defense. Uh, James Moses has had an outstanding uh, spring as well as, uh, as an outstanding summer. Uh, Sean Van Horst, uh, one of the best college corners that I've seen in a long time. So I think we're going to have an outstanding defense. On our offense, certainly our offensive line uh, has a number of veterans returning. Uh, Willie Felder, uh, Galladay is coming back after having a, a great year last year. Paul Ramsey at center. Uh, I think those individuals will be the hub of our offensive line. 
in the backfield, James Carpenter will be given the opportunity to come in and play. Uh, after watching uh, Fred Killings and Harvey Reed the past two years, I think he's really excited about this year. At the quarterback position, we have a number of individuals that we feel will uh, come in and, and give us a good uh, job at quarterback. Uh, we'll probably line up with Donald Carr. Uh, he's a sophomore and a, a guy with great quickness, and we feel like he will be able to come in and, and guide the Howard attack. We'll start off with UDC and uh, see what happens there and go up to the Mel Lands and, and play Grambling, and uh, one at a time, we'll see how we fare. Well, it's going to be a rough season for Steve Wilson in his first year as coach of the Howard University Bison. Not only is his first year as coach at Howard, it's his first coaching job ever. He spent 10 years in the National Football League with the Dallas Cowboys and the Denver Broncos. His alma mater is Howard University. And he steps in not at a great time, not so much uh, the timing was good for him coming away from the pros and going into college, but Howard University is conducting an internal vest investigation into its football program, dealing with irregularities now early in the uh, or back in the winter the last part of february they found eight or nine players ineligible because they had played five years and they then went on in the further investigations reveal some more irregularities in the football program this was done as a as a part of an internal investigation by howard university irregularities included not paying players their full grant and aid money and using players for more than the maximum four seasons and the violations that i speak of uh, span the last six seasons and are against NCAA and Mideastern Athletic Conference rules. Larry Barber is here from the Mideastern Athletic Conference. Uh, we know that this is an internal investigation. The conference so far has not taken any type of stand. What is the conference position right now on the, uh, the problem at Howard University and what we've seen? Well, you really said it, Charlie. The conference office is not taking any position because we have not received a written report from Howard University itself. That we need a written, the commission needs a written report before he makes any move at all. He I won't move until he gets a written report. I know in 1987, Howard was the conference champion. They are talking about should they uh, find or finish this, when they finish this investigation, they feel that they should forfeit that championship. Uh, coach Jeffries, Willie Jeffries, who's now moved on to South Carolina State, was the coach of the Howard University team through this period, which is in question. Uh, there were players who said that they were promised things for scholarship money and things of this nature that they did not receive. Uh, of course, Coach Jeffries has been mum on the situation, and I'm sure most people, except the legal counsel people, will stay mum until this whole thing comes out and is brought to light. Uh, this could haunt Coach Jeffries down the road at South Carolina State. Well, I'm sure he's, uh, well, naturally he's aware, but like I said, he's mum on it. Everybody's mum on it right now until Howard finishes this. Invest internal investigation. And you're waiting for a written report, and that's going to be a pat answer. I know <laughs> that you rehearsed it, and you rehearsed it, and rehearsed it. But the fact of the matter is that uh, there are some irregularities. You cannot overlook the fact that uh, when you bring a young man in, you promise him certain things. You know, a lot of, we had a little discussion we were sitting around before that we started taping of the show, and we were talking about how responsible the young men who play these sports are, but the coaches are the ones that are really responsible because when a young man comes to play for you or a young lady, whether it be football, basketball, whatever, or track or soccer, volleyball, you as a student athlete trust or put your trust in what those coaches who have recruited you say. And it's, uh, if the coach tells you you can play five years, evidently he knows what he's talking about. Why would a coach do something of this nature and create a problem for a young athlete? And I really feel that possibly that when Coach Jeffries left uh, Howard University, he probably didn't do it with any malice or any uh, of that nature, but he felt that probably one of his assistants would have taken over and that maybe this investigation would not have gotten to where it is right now. Okay. Well, you said it. You know, that's a good question. Why a coach was to tell, tell a student that, a young student athlete that? And uh, that's a question that we really, you know, who can answer that? Uh, if, if wins or losses mean that much, maybe they do. But, you know, th what you're talking about is all uh, things that the media has written. Uh, maybe BT has done its own investigation to things you were saying. We don't know anything about that other than what we read in the papers. I'm talking about the conference office.
and the conference will wait until it gets a written report. And I, I <laughs> will quote a statement from Commissioner Ken Free, who's when notified of the Howard investigation, could not officially make a decision on the forfeiture of the 1987 championship until, as you said, he received written <laughs> notification from the schools. He said, and I quote, normally if it's a first time offense, a reprimand is given to the university. The strongest sanction you can take is a forfeiture of a championship, and they are doing that. The conference would not take any other steps. But I'm sure the NCAA is also getting involved in this. And then, you know, uh, they've had a problem down at Grambling. We'll talk about that with Russell in a moment. This, again, uh, where, as I said, it could follow Coach Jeffries. Grambling, for those who may not know, uh, the basketball program has been put on probation, and the coach who was there uh, through this and these infractions that Grambling suffered has been banned from coaching in the at any NCAA institution for five years. So if and I don't know how, what the, how you compare the seriousness of what happened at Grambling with what the investigation may reveal at Howard, but if that's any indication, there may be reason for Coach Jeffries to have some concern. Russell, you have any comment on that? Well, I'll agree with you, Charlie. Uh, the NCAA has, has sanctioned Grambling. Uh, they've been placed on probation for a year. The number of basketball scholarships have been cut. Uh, the institution itself uh, reduced the number of assistant basketball coaches. Uh, Grambling will not be able to participate in any po pre- or post-season game. And as you've indicated, uh, Coach Hopkins cannot uh, coach at any NCAA-affiliated uh, institution for the next five years. Uh, that's a pretty stiff penalty, and uh, we're sort of in mourning at uh, the SWAC office. Okay, let's change gears a minute and get on a more happy note, I guess. Larry, you, you're ready for this, <laughs> through this cross-examination. Let's talk about what's happening. Uh, but before we get into that, let's go back. Last time you were here, you, you, you skated because it was right after I the football. Yes, you did. You skated. It was on thin ice, too. It was right after the foot basketball uh, football season. It was the beginning of basketball, and we were trying to find out who was going to be the conference football champions because it was up in the air between uh, Florida A&M, Delaware State, and Bethune. It started out with Florida A&M beat Delaware State the first game of the season, early in the season. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Delaware State beat, was no, it the opposite? Florida A&M won the game. Florida A&M won the game. There was uh, some discussion about Delaware State using an eligible player. Mm. Delaware State forfeited a game down the road somewhere. Florida A&M somehow was found that they've used an ineligible player. In the very same game, John. In the first? The very same game. That happened. That same game. The same in the game. same game. And that was found out later on. And then Florida a and M wasn't eligible for the conference, so they just gave it to Bethune Cookman. No, no, no. no. Now tell us well, what when, happened. When you, before, you <laughs> if you get to the standings, like you've uh, done the rest of the conferences, you will see that uh, Bethune Cookman, Florida a and M, Delaware State, all We're tied, four and two. Okay, let's in the let's look at the conference. Let's, and, let's look uh, at the standings. <laughs> and if, and the, the three teams are tri, tri champions. They were tri champions, but because of all of those. The, what determined the tiebreaker then? When there was no tiebreaker because there was no postseason play. What so determined? We, there, there was no tiebreaker. No, but what determined? You said they were tri captains. Tri, tri champions. Tri champions. All had but same. actually, Bethune was given the championship. No, they weren't. They were not. No, they had the same record as Florida A&M and Delaware State. So how, why is everybody saying Bethune was the champion? Well, the reason they're saying that is because Bethune couldn't beat those two teams on the field. So that was only somebody's mythical championship. That was not the conference championship. Right. We had so Bethune was not the conference championship no. champion Bethune, last year. Bethune, Pittman, Delaware State, and Florida A&M. Now that's news to me. That's the first time I heard that because I've got written down here somewhere that Ken Riley was the coach of the year. But like, like Bethune, Cookman, like this I see, we our our coaches do the voting for the head for the. Uh, I understand the, that, but I also had again. written down wow. that Bethune was the conference champ. Now you're telling me you something be. different. No, you, you, I don't know where you got your information okay. from. Okay, so like I said, they were Those mythical three champs. Three teams finished 4-2 and two in the conference are deemed tri champions. All right. Now, what's going to happen this year? <laughs> now you've got Bethune, you've got Florida a you've got Delaware State as far as the way they finished, then Howard, South Carolina State, and, uh, and, uh, South Carolina, and North Carolina A&T along with Morgan. Uh, 
the, to round out what's happening in the conference. You have nine schools in your conference. Yeah. Seven of them play football. Uh, you had a couple coaching changes also this year. Of course, we talked about Willie Jeffries leaving Howard University. He went to South Carolina State. Steve Wilson comes in as the head coach at uh, Howard University. Those are the two coaching changes that you had there. Uh, how do you look at the conference this year? What's going to happen? What are the, some of the predictions? Interesting enough, those same three teams that finished <laughs> tied last year are uh, the favorites this Just year. Just tell them to use all eligible players <laughs> so we don't have this problem at the end of the year. I wanted to go through this next season, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Neither will I. <laughs> Florida has been picked by the media, the coaches, as well as the SIDs to finish first. Uh, Delaware State second, but don't cook them third. Uh, South Carolina State with Willie Jeffers down there in uh, Orangeburg, now fourth. Uh, Howard University, a and sort of right in the middle, four, mm -hmm. or five or six or whatever. And Morgan fi uh, figures to finish last again this year. But going back to our coaching change, it's very interesting. You know, Coach Jeffers was back within South Carolina State during this early, se well, early 70s to 78, where he became the winningest coach in the MEAC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Continu continuous winning ways at Howard University. Now he's naturally the winningest coach in the conference. Uh, Florida and m of course, uh, with the Ken Raleigh. Uh, we'll win on our strong defense so, and special teams. We have, we're very excited about our young man, Howard Huckabee, sure. setting NCAA, uh, one AA record last year with four touchdowns on punt returns. We saw about three of them <laughs> on BET. <laughs> Very yeah. good. And uh, quarterback Antoine Ezell, who's a preseason all MEAC uh, quarterback, Antoine Ezell. Uh, Delaware State returns 18 starters. And that's why uh, I really think they're going to they're really be strong. Uh, they have a fine uh, kick return in Tim Edgerton. Mm -hmm. They had the NCAA in uh, punt returns, actually. And Skip uh, as well, of course, you talked about him. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, strong defensive backs, and Reg, uh, Reggie Johnson and uh, Eric Wainwright, going from, he's like a roving back, mm -hmm. linebacker to, uh, to uh, defensive back. Bethune-Cookman, always strong in wide receivers. They have Stevie Thomas this year. For the first time, Bethune-Cookman won't have a featured quarterback. For the last five years, they've always had, always had that good quarterback. This year, they're looking for one. Looks like Lamarck Anderson might emerge out of that. It'll be the starting quarterback from Bethune-Cookman. But, uh, of course, Larry Little, XO All-Pro, will find a way to win down there. Uh, a lot of pro coaches people. in your conference. Yes. Uh, Ford uh, Howard, and you got the, 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 uh, Larry Little at Bethune, Ken Raleigh at Florida and m Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, the, you know, talking about how a coach is, not only is Steve uh, coming out of 10 years from the NFL, but he's surrounding himself with three coaches. You know, Charlie the West, NFL. Uh, Reuben Carter, Reuben Carter, and Roger, Roger Jackson. Jackson. Right, yeah. So what Steve has done is really built a strong team around himself. Okay. Thank you uh, all. I know I had you on the hot spot there, Larry. Hey, no that's problem. the way it goes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you too, man. You'll be all right. You can always come to work for BET, no problem. Uh, <laughs> we'll be back to talk about our upcoming schedule in just a moment. Stay with us. It promises to be an exciting season right here on BET. And I'd like to thank Russell Stockard from the Southwestern Athletic Conference, also Jim Alnuti from the SIAC, Ann Little from the CIAA, and Larry Barber from the MEAC. And uh, we'll kick off our 1989 black college football season live here on BET next Saturday. We hope you'll join us. Our first game will come from Mobile, Alabama. It'll be the Gulf Coast Classic between Southern and Alabama State, a SWAC matchup, 8 p.m. Eastern time from Ladd Stadium. Then we'll travel to Cleveland, Ohio. It'll be a Friday night contest. Where Tennessee State takes on Central State in the Cosby Classic at 8 p.m. Eastern. That'll be a live telecast, a special Friday night edition of Black College Football. And then the following week, we'll be in Columbus, Ohio for the Martin Luther King.
at Bayou Classic football games. That'll come your way 2 p.m. Eastern time right here on BET. And then on Thanksgiving Day, join us for the Turkey Day Classic from the Crampton Bowl in Montgomery, Alabama, as Tuskegee takes on Alabama State. And then the Saturday following Thanksgiving, you'll see the Bayou Classic grambling against Southern from the Superdome in New Orleans. That's our schedule. We hope you'll join us. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next Saturday as we kick off our 1989 college football season. So long. Sunshine Network feature event. The capital skyline of Tallahassee, the setting this evening before the 1989 season opening showdown between Tuskegee and Florida A&M. It's a rivalry that has produced shocking results through the years. Case in point, two seasons ago, right here in historic Bragg Stadium. That's Florida A&M's Howard Huckabee trying to get away from Tuskegee's Golden Tigers, but he can't. They would hold him in check. And later, Tony Carroll hurling to wide receiver Roselle Daniels for the touchdown. Tuskegee would upset Florida A&M and roll on to the Division II Black College Championship. Tonight, these two have at it again. The Golden Tigers from Tuskegee Institute and the Rattlers of Florida A&M. The setting, Bragg Stadium in Tallahassee is 15th rate A&M plays host to Tuskegee. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to very warm Tallahassee, Florida. I'm Paul Kennedy, set to call the play-by-play, -play, but when you come to Tallahassee, you have to think of Bragg Stadium when you're talking about all-time winning teams in the history of college football. Take a look at these numbers. The top eight teams in the NCAA historically listed in terms of all-time victories. Notre Dame heads the list. Look who comes in number seven, ahead of Big Eight Power Oklahoma. It is Florida A&M with 389 victories at a 72% clip. They could really do it. A lot of national championships in there as well, and a fellow who quarterbacked the Rattlers to a couple of national titles back in the 70s. Al Chester joining us up here this evening, and Al Florida A&M finally gets it underway here in 1989. I spoke with Ken Riley earlier today. He's very excited about the season, and the, and the kids are fired up, and I anticipate a great ball game. Let's talk about Tuskegee's signal caller first, and we begin with Maurice Hurd. He's a good one. Maurice Hurd is, uh, is a very experienced quarterback. He's very potent, and I think that uh, with the activity that he produced last year, running and passing for over 1,400 yards, we expect a, a fine performance for him, and he could be a knack in the rally's attack today if he's not, uh, the defense is not sharp. Howard Huckabee returned four punts for touchdowns a year ago. One more, and he establishes an NCAA record. We saw him just a moment ago, number 12. He can really scoot for Florida A&M. No doubt about it. Howard is a premier punt return in the country. Uh, we're anticipating great things from him. Uh, he started out with a few nicks and bumps, but I think Howard is ready to go, and we're, we're expecting big things from him. And he's also a high pro prospect. It's a big night here for Al and I in uh, Bragg Stadium, and Stacy Stracis will be out on the field throughout the evening. We anticipate seeing as well the Marching 100, the Florida A&M Marching Band. Going to be a great night. Glad you're along. It is Tuskegee and Florida A&M putting it on the tee for the first time in 1989, and our opening kickoff is coming up next. <laughs> Tuskegee here in Bragg Stadium in Tallahassee on this very warm September evening. Temperature in the 90s, very humid, slight chance of rain from Atlanta, Georgia. Jim Askew will head the officiating crew. The last time these two teams met, it was Tuskegee in that shutout shocker in single safety to receive for the Golden Knights. That's a freshman, Orlando Robinson from Natchitoches, Louisiana. And a kickoff for Florida A&M, the junior, number four, Jimmy Viterno, from right here in Tallahassee and Florida High School. A year ago, Florida A&M on the field, seven wins, three losses, one tie. They finished as co-champions, along with Bethune-Cookman and Delaware State in the MEAC. They're at the 1AA level in the NCAA. Tuskegee plays a Division II schedule. 
in the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference. Florida A&M representing one of two teams that they will face from the higher 1AA rank, the other Alabama A&M. Bertuno with his left arm into the air. And we are set and ready to have at it. Opening night in Bragg Stadium. We're glad you're along for the ride. This will be taken by an up man at the 25-yard line. And up to the 26. And down he goes. That's Derek Streeter on the return of 12, the tight end. Maurice Hurd, the quarterback, the junior. And his backs and receiver, Mason Wilson, the leading returning rusher, Lee Holder Streeter, the freshman tight end. The offensive line, Borden Brunson, Madison Johnson is a good one at center, DeVoe and Pearl. Heard the junior from Tuskegee and Tuskegee High School in Alabama. He sets him down. First play of the night, loose ball on the field. And it's recovered by Florida Adams. The fullback, Tony Moffitt, could not get the handoff cleanly. And big Urban Clark, the nose tackle, stuffed him to cause the fumble. What they were trying to do is uh, just run a reverse dive there, uh, which is the normal play to start the series. We got fumble, bad connection. We got the ball back. One play. One turnover, and here you unleash that man, Tony Ezell. 11 touchdown passes last year for number 14. And he is at the Tuskegee 26 and looking for number 12. Deep in throws, it's tapped into the air and knocked down incomplete. Condre Payne, the defensive back, with the fine play off the throw by Ezell, and he was looking for Howard Huckabee. As you see, Ezell from Mobile and McGill Tulin High School. His skill, folks, and boy, are they talented. Huckabee, the intended receiver. Troy Allen's a senior tight end. The offensive line is huge, anchored by the preseason All-American, Terry Buford. Second down and 10. Off the right side, on the sweep, Rasul inside the 20, breaks the tackle inside the 15, down to the 14-yard line. We get our first look, Al, at Amir Rasul, the junior from Tallahassee, a fine all-purpose running back. This play is similar, uh, similar to the Washington Redskins uh, counter tray. Got a lot of movement up front. The offensive line did a super job, and the back uh, executed well. Robert Frost is a huge pulling guard, the all-MEAC left guard, the junior, 255 pounds. And he was leading the interference. The defensive line for Tuskegee, Eric Easley, is 270 himself. The man in motion is Huckabee. Dancing, Rasul, a good move as he nears the 10-yard line. He nearly lost yardage on the play. Yeah, what? The linebackers, James Martin, Howard Long, Cleveland Gibson, a veteran, Ronald Legree on the outside. And in the secondary, three of those four fellows are freshmen, although Gregory Quinney, in a last-second change, starts in place of Artie Smith at the free safety position. The ball is at the 11, second and six. Azell, guns, near side, complete at the nine, and there's Rasul. We saw him carry a couple of times, and now Amir on the receiving end. I think Coach Riley wants to try to exploit those young freshman defensive backs, and uh, if the kid had kept his feet that time and been able to turn up field, I think he might have had a touchdown. If you're just joining us, on the first play from scrimmage, Tuskegee fumbled. And here is Florida A&M trying to capitalize on that turnover. Facing third down and a long five. Inside the 10-yard line, they must penetrate the five. From the eye set, down the line option, loose ball the other way. And Tuskegee, well, they can't get it back. How in the world did they miss pouncing on that one? The linebacker, Cleveland Gibson, number 90, had nothing but green grass and a brown football, and now he missed it. I tell you, Tony uh, didn't execute real well. I think on that option, he should have pitched that ball a little early because it was just him and the defensive end. Nobody out on the back. He pitched that ball early. We had a good play. First field goal try of the night, Jimmy Bertuno out of Azell's hole. 
This will be a 39-yard effort. Now, remember, this year in college football, there is no T. He's kicking off the grass, and he hooked it. It's no good. Tuskegee holds on, even though fumbling, and then missing an opportunity to recover the fumble, Al Chester. We're still scoreless as Jimmy Viterno misses his first collegiate try for the Rattlers. I tell you, one of the things you want to do is kill a mosquito with an axe. That's, that's been a tenacious <laughs> attempt, a tenacious approach by the Rattlers for years. It's been tradition, and we didn't go out and execute real well, and we came up empty-handed. The Florida A&M defensive front, Irvin Clark, he's the guy that caused the fumble earlier. The linebacking core is feisty. We'll be talking about them throughout the evening. Holder comes in motion this way, the tailback on the call. And Mason Wilson trying to go outside. He has a few, some good hard running. The first man to hit him, the quarterback, Lowell Crawford, the senior. At 5'9", not enough to take him down cleanly. That's a gain of uh, six. The secondary, you see Crawford at the bottom of your screen. He made the stop there. J.C. Rainey. Evers at the top of your screen. They call him Petey. A popular member of that FAMU secondary. Second and a long three for Maurice Harrell to Wilson. And driven back. The left outside linebacker, Daryl Davis, a fellow who led FAMU in tackles a year ago with an even 100 out. He was the first one there with the orange headgear. The defense looked real strong. It looked real strong up front. Tuskegee's not getting much movement. The guys are forcing and playing real good defense. Possession snap now. Third. And the Crimson and Gold needs three. To the near side comes the flanker Christopher Holder. To the stop by the top of your screen, Mark Lee. time some indecisiveness on the sidelines not getting the play in and they may cost him five the defense, game. the defense gave uh, Tuskegee a different look that time I think it kind of confused the quarterback uh, they came out and had uh, two deep secondary two deep safeties and the quarterback was a little uh, puzzled as to uh, what he wanted to do I think he probably wanted to check off Rick Kravitz coordinates the defense for Kent Riley who was a great defensive player in his own right and there is Florida A&M's fine head coach and athletic director, Jim Martin, and there, his counterpart in Ken Riley. Cat and Mouse in a third and three is now changed to a third and eight, and the formation becomes trips to the near side right. Three receivers. Hurt. Flag down. Enough for the first down if the play stands to Holder. Upfield at the 36-yard line. But the line judge threw the flag right as the ball was snapped. And the referee, Jim Askew, will let us know what the call is. They tried to shiver the wide out of the line of scrimmage. So what you'll find, you'll find that uh, Ken has got a secondary playing a lot of man-to-man -man defense, which is tough. And these guys come out and, uh, and execute real well. But on that particular play, we, our cornerback got called for holding. That is the first completion of the night for Maurice Hurd. Good for 11 yards and Holder on the receiving end. Viger High School in Mobile, a storied prep football power. This is enough for the first down and the penalty of holding will be declined. So it's first and 10 Tuskegee and given the tape avoided surrendering early points to Florida A&M off the turnover and now have that third down completion there, you would have to believe their confidence is swelling. Paul, I told you earlier that if you let a team that with this kind of potential think they can win, you're going to be in big trouble. We've played nearly five minutes of the first quarter. We're still scoreless as Hurd sets them down and sends Holder in motion. The tailback, a big hole, and still on his feet, Mason Wilson. The junior, the leading rusher a year ago for the Golden Tigers with 320 yards, found a good-looking hole off the right side. Yeah, Mason is a big kid. He ran well. He's good and strong. And they got a lot of movement on the offensive line. Shredding tacklers. And 
the stop is by Sean Williams, the defensive back. A gain of six. Holder comes in motion to set up twin receivers to the bottom of the screen. Off the counter. He'll try it the other way. And not much there this time. Eddie Metcalf, the tough senior inside linebacker from Panacea and Wakula High School, was right there to fill the hole. The Tigers tried to trap out tackle that time, Paul, and, and uh, didn't have much success. Linebacker sealed and filled in real well and made the tackle. This is the sixth play of a possession that began following the missed field goal try of 39 yards by Paterno and Florida A&M. A possession snap again. Florida A&M shows blitz and here they come. Third wants to throw and looking to do so on the run and it's incomplete at midfield. He was cutting out of the backfield. Mason Wilson and threw it too high for Wilson had a step on the linebacker would have been enough for the first down and so we take another look had he not been pressured this may have been another first down see a little play action there by Hurd he rolls out wants to hit that back coming out of the backfield just a little bit too much and an incomplete pass to punt is Keith Bolton and it tumbles off the right side of his foot, bounds inside the 30, and takes a Tuskegee roll inside the 25 to the 24. It wasn't pretty when it left its right leg, but it's a kick of 44 yards without a return. And when you're kicking toward a fellow like Howard Huckabee, that's near perfection. I agree with you, Paul. I think that uh, that was a perfect punt, punting away from Huckabee. Just keeping the rallies inside the 30-yard line is a... It's not a bad idea. Jim Martin has been at Tuskegee for 19 years. In his sixth year now as the head football coach and his second as the Golden Tigers athletic director. Second possession of the night for Florida A&M. Off the right side is Stacy LeMay, the fullback, the 220 pound junior from Newark, New Jersey. And he moves the stakes a couple of yards. It's second down and a long eight. James Martin, the strong linebacker, on the stop. LeMay last season with 223 yards rushing. Average better than four yards a carry. Play action, Mazzell quickly to the sideline. Nice grab, first down and out of bounds as he finds Amir Rasul. Hey, Rasul gets up there pretty well with those hands and comes down in bounds. Rasul's a fine athlete. You find a little play action here. Tony drops back, looks downfield, look the safety off, pass the ball out to the backfield. It's uh, this fine athlete right here makes a super catch and gets out of bounds. Now, what's wrong with that picture? There were no white jerseys in it when he came down. A linebacker to let him go. That's right. First down off the gain of eight. From his 35-yard line. Oh, the four. Missed the pitch. Azell has to go back and scramble, and he'll lose four. Howard Law, the left inside linebacker, credited on the stop, but Rasul went one way, and the pitch was behind him. Yeah, Paul, it looks just like uh, it was a mix-up, a, a major mix-up there. Uh, Tony was ready to pitch the ball, and Rasul wasn't ready for it. Here we go. It, I, let's see what happened. They hit the fullback on the arm. LeMay. That caused a problem, and uh, Ezell picked it up and uh, was productive with it. Tim Daniel to the top of your screen, the wide receiver on second and long, second and 15. Away from pressure now to the boundary and incomplete. Even though surrounded by three white jerseys, the tight end Troy Allen had a chance to make the catch. He's a big target at 6-4, but the pass was overthrown. Tony's doing a fine job getting that ball out. He's, he's up under the ball a little bit, so it's, it's sailing on him. So if you can bring that ball down a little bit, I think you have a whole lot more success. Here we go. Get a good look at it here. Drops back. He can set his feet. Step and throw. He's up under that ball just a little bit, and it's sailing on him. Huckabee 
wide to the near side left on third and 15. Azell in the pocket, down the middle. Down. Excellent execution. I see Tony calling the signals. Drops back. Watch, he'll set his feet a little better this time. Plant, and he'll throw right on top of it, right between two defenders. Great catch, great execution. Here's showing athletic ability, maintaining his balance, and staying in bounds, coming up with a big game. A gain of 37. And now pounding hard up the middle, Stacy LeMay off the left side. Works it for seven more. Gregory Quinney, the junior free safety, in on the stop for Tuskegee, which has to be stunned by the previous play. The linebacker, Ronald McGree, was this close to batting it away. And it's those kind of plays that turn into 37-yard games. That's exactly right. The gamble going for the interception, and you miss, you come up with a big play. There is timeout on the field. We'll step aside as well. No score midway through the first quarter. <laughs> Girls championships at 8 o'clock Eastern, and then Monday night, September 4th, the men's championships at 10.30 Eastern, right here on the Sunshine Network. Tuskegee used the timeout to cool off a very hot Rattler squad. No score, but Florida a and is moving the football down to the 20 yard line works Jonathan Jones the fullback 510 191 pounds in there behind LeMay Howard Long the linebacker in on the stop you see Jones there he's a former lineman now the guy recovering from a leg injury but getting some work here early on opening night the 15-yard line. Rasul has now carried the ball three times for a dozen yards and caught a couple passes. Exhib, just kind of uh, a sweep to the right. He's, at, he's executed real well. The guards get out for the block. He gets to what he can. One of the things you, I want to mention, Paul, you can see that uh, a is taking the momentum of this football yep. game early. We need to execute and come out and score now. The Heat, too. I'm surprised they've already used a timeout. 6-0-4 remaining. Nice fake by Azell. He's scrambling. Inside the 10. Cuts back to the 5. The big hit applied off the trail by the linebacker Rogers Hunt, the sophomore. But it's a first out, and as you said, momentum is wearing green and orange. One of the things Coach Ken Riley wanted to see Tony do was utilize his athletic ability, which is what he's doing right now. He's showing you folks he can run the football as well. Outstanding play, outstanding fate. It's first and goal in a scoreless first quarter. Florida A&M took over at its 24-yard line. To the tailback, not for It appeared to be Patrick Rennick on the carry. And that is the fifth running back to carry the football in the first quarter alone for Ken Riley's team. Ken doesn't have a problem spreading the wealth. There's a, a wealth of talent in his ball club. So don't be surprised, uh, Paul, if you see a lot of different players tonight. Second and goal at the four. Full house backfield. Mazzell, left pass option. And now floating it. The intended receiver, Greg Wynn, the tight end. Pretty good call because if you run out of room or if the receivers are covered, you, you do just that. I don't think that was a super effort on the tight end's part. All the backs go one way. Tony goes the opposite direction. It's a sprint out pass. I think he has the option of running or passing. 
and he opts for the pass, tries to loft it over the defensive head. The guy comes up and makes a super grab. It's just a little bit too far, and he's out of bounds. Missed it by that much. Third and goal from the fourth. And now Florida A&M has to call timeout. They had 12 men on the field. Stacy LeMay was in the game and was substituted for. And there's timeout. We'll step aside as well. No score. We'll return in a moment. <laughs> coming at you at 3 o'clock right here on the Sunshine Network. Hey, you played for the Argonauts in your CFL days. How about those Blue Jays? They caught the Orioles. Blue Jays are having an outstanding season. Unlike uh, 1979 when I was in Toronto, they were struggling. <laughs> uh, but uh, this year they seem to have got that uh, whole spirit together and, and function real well as a ball club. So is your old school right here, Florida A&M. Okay, we got you see here on third and goal from the four on a drive that's netted four first downs the spin out by Azell and it's deflected and complete intended for Rasul out of the backfield and broken up cleanly by Walter Weston the sophomore linebacker with an outstanding effort inside the 20-yard line you're gonna find the defense play a lot of man coverage here you got straight linebacker on back and the guy makes a super job I think Tony may have uh, needed to lead him a little bit on that pass. I think he'd have got it to him. Jimmy Paterno missed earlier from 39 yards out. This is a 22-yard chip shot for the soccer-style specialist. In a school that has an outstanding tradition of kickers, Herb Reinhardt, Sean Gilliam, this time he nails it. Great to nothing. Florida A&M leads early as they drive close to 80 yards on Tuskegee. And the 22-yard conversion drilled by Berturno, his first collegiate field goal. Oh, I think it was very significant that uh, FAMU came away from that particular drive with some points. It's the second drive they had that uh, got inside the 20, and it was very significant that they come away with some points. 13 plays, 72 yards officially. More important than that, they ate better than five minutes off the clock. Jim Martin can pick up his 23rd victory as he tries to rebuild Tuskegee this season. It's a very young defense he has out on the field, is it not? That is true. Uh, Big Jim has been known to be an educator, an innovator, and a gentleman and a recruiter. He's got to fire these guys up. Florida a ms Tony Uzel showing that he can run the offense, makes few mistakes, they salvage three out of it. And it's number three for Tuskegee and Orlando Robinson trying to field it and he cannot take him by an up man. And loose ball again. Given up by Diedrich Streeter. After a return of 16 yards, but recovered by Tuskegee. And it's time that we once again welcome that fellow Maurice Hurd back onto the football field, the quarterback of the Golden Tigers. The scoring drive that earns the field goal. Hurd is one for two through the air for but 11 yards. Holder on the receiving end, do you recall, of a third down grab. Quickly the slant in route, and he overshot the wide receiver, Mark Lee. Lee there is from Lakeland here in Florida. Played for Lakeland Senior High School. He returns to his native state, the junior, six feet tall, 180, and you know he'd love to do well. All the time. Anytime you can come back to your home state. I think Tuskegee has uh, five or six players from Florida. Well, they sure do, and the interior of their line now, now that you mention it, Madison Johnson over the football is from Quincy and the two guards Maurice Brunson number 51 is from Lake Wales and on the right side Rudy DeVoe is from Coco second and ten hey he's going deep speed for Holder he makes the pitch through at the 25 yard line awfully awfully close William Petey Evers yeah. probably the best 
defensive back on the field was with him stride for stride. You see an isolation with one on one. Just a straight flat pattern. The defensive back executed real well. Pushed that ball right out of there. Well, you couldn't see it with the graphic there. Whether or not he came down in bounds. It was close. And Hurd wants to throw again under pressure. The kind that will give you nightmare. And Sean Williams will have one. That's one that got away. I think it was too easy for him. I, he saw the end zone and about 50, 40 yards to run. It was just a little too easy. Hit him in a bad place, right in his arms. The junior from Decatur had it hit him right between the two and the five. And here is the all-time punt return leader in Florida A&M history. And our record-setting NCAA specialist set to receive Keith Benton's boot. Flags down. Flag on the, plate. the first kick by Benton, intended for Huckabee, was off the side of his foot, but it ended up rolling 44 yards without being touched. I think the, uh, Tuskegee has visions of the punt return that uh, Huckabee ran against him a couple of years ago, and they definitely tonight don't need that to happen. There is encroachment by Ken Riley's Rattlers. The walk-off is for five. It sets up fourth and five. And here is Benton with Huckabee awaiting his effort right between his legs. He just manages to kick it, and this is a near miracle to the 31-yard line. That's incredible that he managed to get that away. It couldn't have worked out any better. A 43-yard punt, blind. I'll tell you, Paul, this gentleman took a play that could have been a disaster and made it into something, got the ball downfield. Unbelievable. Super job on his part to get it downfield. Irvin Clark, who's a bodybuilder, can bench press more than 400 pounds, nailed him just as he hit it. And it still went 43 yards. Three to nothing, Florida A&M with the lead and the football, less than four minutes remaining in the first quarter. Rasul hurtling at the 30 and up to the 34-yard line. Nifty footwork for the most durable running back tonight. And on a night that's very warm, temperatures in the 90s, and playing a Tuskegee team that is not as deep as Florida A&M, we're going to see a lot of Amir and a lot of other folks out. I believe so. Uh, tonight's a good night. Uh, Ken's ball club is executing well. They're just not coming up with the, the scores. they got to push, push this ball in the end zone and come up with some points. Second down and six. Second time this evening. And it's Gregory Quinning, the free safety on the stop. Reddick runs it hard. I tell you, this is a, a well run, well executed play. This kid's running the ball real hard. I thought that uh, with Sean Gilliam being gone and, and deciding to go to play baseball, that uh, the running game was going to be hurt. But this kid is, all the running backs look real well tonight. First down. Now there works the right side. The plug, Arson Strong with the fine block. You see there the kicker. And Keith Benton, he may have hurt himself after that twisting, desperate effort. But he got the punt away. Keith is a freshman from Decatur. As Patrick Ruddick takes the handoff from the belly option off the pier and rambles for 10. It's a standard straight dive off the pier. Guys executing well, getting a lot of good movement on the, on the offensive line. That's been the key to the whole success. Well, they're moving on him now. Already three first downs in this drive. Less than two minutes to go, a minute 50. It's 
Mazzell. Deep down the boundary, wide open. Flag went at the 15 yard line. First down, Radler. In the area was Gregory Quinney. As we take another look. I think what we got, Paul, here is a busted coverage on Tuskegee's part. However, the tight end does run an excellent right. Tony finds it, hangs it up there, get it up high where he can get his hands on it, and we make a perfect catch. Excellent ex execution. Also there was Willie Hub, actually the freshman strong safety number 19, the first one to arrive as our spotter, Tom Block, points out. First and goal, or first and ten again. They run the reverse. Here's Huckabee in the open field. Watch these moves. Oh, he's tripped up. Inside the 15-yard line, Ronald Lagree made a nice open field stop. Well, Coach Ken Riley goes in his bag of tricks here and comes out with the uh, with the reverse here to Huckabee, his top guy, and uh, doesn't look like a bad play. It's an excellent call. Uh, we came up positive on the end, so that's that's all that really matters. Lagree. 57 tackles last year as a freshman. That was the third highest total on the whole team. Second and nine. Gazelle Airborne. Into the end zone. Huckabee. Well, Huckabee had split the defenders, read the coverage. And Azell, again, too high. It's the third time tonight he's overshot him, Al. I think he's a little excited. His people are wide open. He's still up under the football, so consequently the ball is sailing on him. He's got Hulk wide open here. No excuse for not hitting him on this one. First game jitters. We need to kill a mosquito with an axe, though. <laughs> third down and nine with 35 seconds remaining. Tuskegee is going to use its second timeout of the first quarter. Some defensive confusion on that third down call. And while we have a moment, let's take a look at other action. And earlier today, the big shocker in Jacksonville. Condolences to Bobby Bowden and his Florida State Seminoles will have highlights of this one. Congratulations to Curly Holman and the Golden Eagles. 30 to 26, the last minute touchdown, the difference. Clemson, which is next up on Florida State's schedule, beats Furman handily in Death Valley. Virginia Tech, no trouble with Jerry Faust and the Akron Zips. It's West Virginia in a waltz over Ball State. And out west, Pitt beats Pacific. 38-3. Herc Russell, a big winner over Valdosta State. <laughs> Keep the women and children at home. The Boomer Sooners are back. Louisville, 28-21 over the Cowboys. And Maryland is beaten in Raleigh by NC State. 10 to 6. Air Force put some points on the board this afternoon against the Aztecs to win that Western Athletic Conference battle. Here tonight in Bragg Stadium in Tallahassee. It's the MEAC, the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, against the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference as host Florida A&M welcomes Tuskegee Institute to campus. And with but 35 seconds to go in period number one, Florida A&M has a field goal, and Ken Riley knows he ought to have at least 14 more. Easy. I'm sure he's frustrated. Florida a and had the football down inside the 20-yard line all night long. Just have not been able to come up with the, with the touchdowns. The kicker, we just found out uh, the kicker will be coming back, the putter. I don't know if he wants to, though. <laughs> it was handled that last time. Like a man to go out there. Third and nine. And at halftime, we'll be visiting with our field reporter, Stacy Strasis. And we'll be entertained as well by the marching 100 from Florida AM. and On third down, Hazel in trouble. Fires incomplete. Five-yard line. The best pass rush of the night. Initially, I thought perhaps screen, but if it was, the play was not executed well. Wasn't quite a screen. It, it looked like a, a drag of some type away from the floor of the, of the, of the offense. Uh, Tony's still not setting his feet right and, and been able to, to deliver the ball, so consequently we're not hitting our, our passes. 
But we'll take three and run with it, though. A good from 22, and wide left from 39, Jimmy Vertuno, to try and make it two out of three and as the first quarter winds down. And the Rattlers, a six-point lead. And he does. Good for a second time this evening. The field goal has Florida A&M. The six to nothing advantage. Good from 30 yards out. And the junior from Tallahassee in Florida High School. Who I said earlier this was his first varsity action. It's not. Actually, last year he kicked four field goals in one game to set a record. Did so against Tennessee State. He's halfway to that mark in the first quarter tonight. Jim is a seasoned veteran. He's doing a good job. He's got a lot of confidence. And confidence this year with the new rulings. Kickers can't use the tee. He's doing a super job. He looks a lot bigger and stronger, too, Paul. The marching 100, warming up for halftime. The pregame show was spectacular. We wish you could have been here. You saw that, though, nine plays, 56 yards, and again, that defense was on the field for four minutes and 15 seconds. I think that's very significant. That shows the offense is stable and moving the ball well and eating up a lot of the clock. of a return. The stop by Florida A&M's Darrell Smith. An eight-yard return. See, Paul, one thing about the Florida A&M's uh, special teams, this kickoff team, they're running down in their lanes, executing well, doing a super job. Just one of four through the air. And he'll put it on the ground. And the hole is absolutely filled. Eddie Metcalf was there. Daryl Davis, actually, the left outside linebacker. A guy who had added 15 pounds to his frame in the offseason. Filled it up well. The end of the first quarter is here. Your score from Bragg Stadium, homestanding Florida A&M by two field goals, leading visiting Tuskegee, six to nothing. Welcoming you back to Bragg Stadium here on the campus of Florida A&M, where the homestanding Rattlers rank 15th among the NCAA's 1AA teams, lead that ball club and the Golden Tigers of Tuskegee by two field goals. Maurice Hurd ready to work, second and ten as the second quarter opens. Throwing deep, looking for Holder, who makes the catch inside the 40. Holder inside the 35, and although double covered, it's the biggest gain of the night for Tuskegee as he picks up 45 yards. Maurice Hurd drops back and executes real well. He's showing everyone why he's the potent quarterback we talked about earlier. Caught Ford in him and man defense. The defensive back was looking the wrong way. The ball went right over the right shoulder. The guy executed, made a great catch. And Holder, who a year ago had nine receptions and one touchdown, just a sophomore, was something there. Mason Wilson! through a gaping hole and has finally wrestled down close to a first down and he picked up nine taken down at the 25. The tall sweep here I tell you Sean made a touchdown saving tackle on that plate. Good Sean heads up Williams. Ball, please. The first quarter numbers Al. Florida and Rattles had eight first downs had a 75 yards passing total 115 yards. Compared to only 26 for Tuskegee. Holder in motion. Look how deep the tailback is. 10 yards in the eye. Trying to tap the ball. Not much there. The ball came loose when Damian Childers, the fullback, hit the ground. Look how big Childers is. He wears number 32. He is 264 pounds. 
as a fullback. He's out of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. He's a big kid. He's just a freshman. <laughs> kind of reminds me of uh, Haywood at New Orleans. He played for the legendary Ed Reed, great high school coach who recently picked up his 250th front coaching victory. Again, the deep set off the tailback. On third, they need a yard to maintain possession. Their deepest drive of the night. The tailback will get the call, and it's speed to the outside for Wilson. First down, out of bounds. Inside the 15. The middle was clogged up, and he used his speed to bounce outside. So Mason Wilson is a big kid, six foot, 215 pounds, and has excellent speed. It really ended up being a foot race to the corner. He was able to turn the corner and execute. There you see he has six rushes for 35 yards. He's having a great night. The second first down of the drive. And you see the speed that got him outside. Trailing by six. Unbalanced to the short side of the field, a peculiar formation. And they took too much time. Do you think they had the right play call? They had three to the, to the boundary set on the near left hand. It looked to me, Paul, like uh, they're getting the plays in kind of late. This is a young, feisty ball club, and uh, the Rallies haven't had the ball inside the 20 early, didn't cash it in. We're unable to come up with points. This, this ball club is just a touchdown away from tying it up. You talk about young. How about this? Every skill position has at least one freshman player at either first or second string, including that fellow there, the freshman specialist, Keith Benton. I mean, everybody is a freshman. Heard. First down, Mason Wilson. Wilson on the drag, coming out of the backfield. Well, it's not a first down, pardon me. It's just a little sprint, sprint out with an option to run. And Hurd reminds me so much of Tracy Ham. He sits right in there and delivers the ball, comes up with uh, a big gain of six, seven, eight yards. Well executed. The Hurd bone instead of the Ham bone. We have now heard about Hurd. You better believe that Ken Riley, the head coach of the Rattlers, has. They gained two on that completion rather than the first. Counter option. Flag down, incomplete, intended for Mark Lee. Here's the counter option action to try and freeze the linebackers, but a penalty flag went down immediately. Just a simple reverse out by the quarterback. He gathers his feet, and he zips the ball out in the flats. Apparently someone moved on the offensive line. Well, it cost him five. The offensive line for Tuskegee goes 289 and 280 at the two tackles, Forden and Pearl, 243 and 303 in Brunson and DeVoe, respectively, and Madison Johnson over the football at 262 and All-American. Paul, there's no way you can tell me that this heat is, has no effect on these guys. It's, it's got to be hurting. Now, they need this score here, too, and it's third and eight. Keeping two backs in for protection. Third being flushed out. You can run, but you cannot hide. Okay. And sooner or later, that pass rush was going to get to it. The big right end, James McDuffie, number 93, finally did. There's a flag, too. And a personal foul a little bit too rough when they finally took down Hurd, probably the frustration of chasing him all over the place. Exactly. Maurice is a fine athlete, just like we talked about earlier. Here he's uh, showing that his, his gift for gab, trying to improvise, make something happen. I think his receivers kind of quit on him. He had nobody to throw the ball to. So consequently, he was sacked. I think what he wanted to do was pass that football. And again, I say this heat, the long workout prior to the game has got these guys worn out. The penalty was for Eddie Metcalf there, number 58, spearing. The quarterback hurt. He put the headgear down, which you cannot do. And that is an automatic first down, and it sets up first and goal. Just like you said, Paul, I think it's a combination of frustration and, and not being able to execute well. This, this team is finding the juice now, getting the confidence, the young and feisty. Trailing six to nothing, 12-24 remaining in the first quarter. Holder in motion to the top of your screen. 
The toss comes back to Wilson. He's got a blocker. He's inside the five to the four to the three to the two. Mason Wilson. Sean Williams up to make the stop. Simple toss left. Led by the full back in the guard. He's getting good execution, good movement on the line. He runs hard. These guys are strong. I tell you, Paul, these guys are getting their confidence back, and they're going to be right back in this game with a touchdown. Second and goal, six feet away from Pater. Over the football, the good one in Madison Johnson, the center. The tailback move. And flags went down. Wilson was just a bit too anxious. He knew he was getting the call, and he started before the ball was snapped. What happened, Paul? I think they had the, the snap on a quick count, and the tailback anticipated and jumped a little soon. The referee, Jim Askew, saw it, as did you. Now, there's an injured Golden Tiger on the field as head coach Jim Martin, surrounded by assistants, looks on. And while he's being attended to, Ken Riley has a moment to decide, do you take the penalty or not? Do you push him back five, or do you set up third and goal from the two? What's been happening, Tuskegee has been killing themselves with small penalties, and it's hurting the execution. The guys look tired. I think the heat's playing on them. Ken's got a decision here to make. Uh, the way his ball club is playing, I would push him back. What do you think, Paul? Well, I would take him back, too. But Ken says, oh, offsetting penalties. Okay. Do it again. It'll still be second and goal from the two-yard line. Rudy DeVoe, who set out last year, was the man shaken up. It, it appears as if he'll return. We'll be returning to the Astrodome in Houston Monday night for the Dodgers and the Strohs, and Houston's given it all it's got to try and catch the Giants. Join us. 2.30, the first pitch of the day on Labor Day. Join the line. Full house backfield, second and goal, again the quick count, and throwing for Holder in the three. Why in the world that Coach Jim Martin would change the entire tempo of his offense once he gets inside the five after being so effective with basic football is a question that needs to be raised. I don't know, but I it's think a different offense inside the ten. He's got uh, young ball players. Really didn't have a reason to because they were executing so well. But again, Paul, he's got that quick count, trying to catch the defense, not ready to go. And at that time, nobody was lined up over the wide receiver, number two. It's now third and goal. You just throw away a play. Let's see if he can salvage the drive. Quarterback sneak, flag down. Again, the quick count. Al, just you're an all-American quarterback that's played in this stadium. Explain it to us. The quick count is, is utilized when you got on a real aggressive defense and you want to do something to catch him off guard. You want to get a, little bit, a faster movement, quick movement. Tuskegee's trying to anticipate uh, the rallies taking the time because they had long drawn out counts and uh, they're not coming up with anything. They're hurting themselves. It'll cost them five, it should. Mr. Askew saying that the call is the legal procedure against Come on, Tuskegee. Come on, Mason. You got it, baby. You got it. We saw this last night from Gene McDowell's UCF Knights. They were going with a quick offense and at a key part of the game it truly hurt them earlier in the year. Early in the year. It's a difficult thing to execute, is it not? A finesse attack. Very much so. I think that uh, Tuskegee being young and fresh, so to speak, it's a little difficult. Some lights have gone out in the scoreboard, as you see. It's malfunction. The time has been wiped off the board, as well as the score, which right now reads Florida A&M 6 and Tuskegee nothing. And now Jim Askew will walk over to visit with Jim Martin. Let's see if we can listen in.
coming up immediately following this ball game. We'll relive that Central Florida and Bethune-Cookman football game. It was a big win for Larry Little's Wildcats last night in Florida Citrus Bowl Stadium. Catch all the action right here on the Sunshine Network. Keep up with Rattler The time is going to be kept by Jim Askew and his crew down on the field. So we'll keep you abreast of what's taking place. One of the last things that Jim Martin wanted to hear. It's a full halftime ahead of us. Dr. Frederick Humphreys will be here from Florida A&M, as will Dr. Walter Reed. And oh my, the FAMU Marching 100. And we'll look at the statistics and the highlights too. Well, former Rattler All-American quarterback Al Chester and myself. Al, this is a beautiful stadium, Bragg Stadium, Bragg Field, remodeled just a couple of years ago, and it's in great shape. It's an outstanding uh, playing field, uh, unlike what we had when uh, when I played ball back about 10, 11 years ago. Uh, That's a prescription athletic surface, state of the art. And on that field, facing third down, third and goal, this is in trouble all the way back at the 25 and now into the end zone he skips it up incomplete as he was looking for Mark Lee and it's fourth down and time for the field goal crew Irvin Clark the nose tackle had broken through to pressure him all what they're trying to do is isolate the receivers one-on-one -on -one with the rather defenders who are playing man-to-man -man. And uh, Hurd is showing some mobility. Time out He's a fine, by the Tigers. super fine athlete who's done a great job. That was pretty close to being a touchdown catch. Very much so. There's timeout on the field taken by Tuskegee. They're third. We're going to step aside as well. It's six to nothing. Florida A&M late in the first half. Tuskegee, six to nothing. But the Golden Tigers from Alabama trying to carve into that lead, Al. Here comes a 15-yard field goal try off the leg of a freshman in Keith Benton. Well, if he can kick field goals the way he can miraculously punt, I wonder what we're liable to see here. I'll tell you. On the hold, Kenneth Milton, number 16. The snap, the spot, the kick. It's good, just inside the left upright. You had to stare at it a while to see if it was in there. Suspense lives on in the former young Mr. Benton. Tuskegee cuts that lead to three. Six to three, your score, and they're able to salvage out of a march that traveled close to 45, 50 yards and earned a half dozen first downs. Oh, it's 12 plays, 70 yards officially. And the first field goal for that young man in Keith Benton. Hands us a six to three ball game here. It's seven to three in Kyle Field in College Station, Texas. The SEC against the Southwest Conference. Duke and South Carolina and Sparky Woods had coaching debut for the game. Steve Spurrier, of course, leading Billy Ray and the Duke Blue Devils. Mississippi State by a touchdown over SEC rival Vandy. In period number one. I bet it's warm in Starkville, Mississippi tonight, too, but in Hattiesburg, they aren't feeling the temperature at all. <laughs> Ken Riley, you look at him and you don't think he's intense. Crosses those legs, crosses the arms, cool and calm, but that's not quite what's under that facade, is it? No, Ken Riley is a very intense individual. He's a smart man. He's just got a different laid back approach on the surface, it appears that way. Tuskegee appeared to attempt the onside kick. Rogers Hunt, a linebacker, ricocheted off a Florida A&M up man, but it was recovered by Cedric Jones. 
playing on the special teams. A dozen plays, 70 yards. And look at the time. They kept the defense to the offense off the field for close to six minutes. Both offenses are executing very well, eating up a lot of the clock, which is what you want to do. But the end result is to score a touchdown. Both teams have come up short. Look at the field position surrendered. The kicking game hurting right now. capitalizing on a very poor kickoff that gives Florida A&M exceptional field position. I would think you'd want to get those guys as far back to their own goal line as you could, having played nationally ranked and higher classified Florida A&M to a 6-3 to three near draw in the first half. Rasul with speed, sliding and slashing through tacklers. Deft with his change of speeds and change in surges of power inside the 20 to the 18 yard line, two yards shy of a first down. A big night for Amir Rasul, is it not? We wind under the nine minute mark as Tony is out. And they continue to let the offensive linemen work against the defensive linemen. And Jonathan Jones was knocked to the green grass by the inside linebacker, number 55, a senior. And Howard Long, he's a Florida native, too. He's from Melbourne, Florida. Melbourne High School. He's coming home. All these guys are, it's like a family reunion almost. Homecoming. Florida a is getting a lot of good movement on the line of scrimmage. Therefore, they're being able to run the football real well. It's a first down. Jonathan Jones from Bradenton, South Beach High School. Sean Gilliam was supposed to be the number one fullback this year, but he takes off and becomes a professional baseball player, and that surprised a lot of folks here. I think it did. Uh, Ken was a little disappointed that he anticipated uh, Sean coming back and being able to make a, a positive contribution to the team. He was a big, strong kid, but he opted to play baseball, uh, thinking further down the line that his opportunity would be better to play for, for baseball. A gain of four. Everybody got the snap count, with the exception of the center. And Nick Morales. And that will push the Rattlers back five. Nick Morales, number 78, the center, in a battle with Wally Williams, number 63. And it was Williams rather than Morales who didn't snap the ball on time. That was quite a battle in fall camp between Williams, the freshman, and Morales, the sophomore. But Coach Riley spoke highly of the freshman. He's the kid that, uh, coming out of high school, felt like he could come in and make a contribution right away. He was very pleased with uh, the kind of physical shape he was in when he got to camp, and consequently, he's playing a lot of football for us here tonight in his first start as a freshman. Second down, 11 yards to go. Gonzell on the slanting round. Huckabee, who's been quiet throughout much of the night, comes up empty-handed again, and he was double-covered. Just a standard three-step drop. He played a little, little man zone. They dropped the safety back a little bit and just uh, Tony tried to shoot it in there to him. Huckabee has yet to catch a pass this evening. And through the air, Azell is not perfection. Only 33%. Now four of 12. Like that four of 11, you're right. The blitz is on. Reddick, the Tallahassee native, with the blitz on, a linebacker left Reddick alone. If they connect, it's six. What you have to always remember as a quarterback, you've got to maintain your cool. You've got to do everything right. What Tony's not doing, he's not setting his feet to pass. He's in a hurry. He's trying to shoot it out there quick, and you just can't do it. The ball is just taking off on him, so consequently, we're coming up short. If he caught that ball, it's going to touch down. I don't know that Tuskegee can beat Florida A&M. But A&M is very capable of beating itself this evening. And leading 6-3, Bertuno has it blocked. In a roll into 
of the end zone be brought out to the 20 yard line and that's what I'm talking about. Florida A&M for the upset to occur will have to contribute to this and thus far the Rattlers are. It's just a six to three ball game advantage Florida A&M with seven and a half minutes remaining in the first half. One of the things about it when you got a young feisty ball club like Tuskegee and they've got the will to want to win. They're young and they're playing over their heads. They're playing in the Rattlers den. They're going to be fired up. It's going to be tough to beat them. The momentum is just like playing ping pong. It's going from one team to the other. Florida A&M keeps coming down and coming up short. Bertuno is only two for four. And his legs the only point. Mason Wilson has his face mask yanked. And there comes the flag. It was Keith Austin, the outside linebacker from Miami, who brushed that face mask. And the officials are deciding if this is of the five or 15 yard variety. Ken Riley's ball club now has got to maintain its cool. They're not, they're not getting it done right now. And they definitely don't need to be penalizing themselves by doing uh, bad things like this. Face mask, holding this type of activity. Just maintain your cool and be persistent. Don't give Tuskegee anything. That's just going to put him right back in the ball game. Keith Austin is known for his intensity. In fact, many of his teammates call him downright me. Number 48, the linebacker. But he just inadvertently brushed the face mask. Well, we had thought of the running back in Austin. And it's marked off at 10 yards here. Five yards from the spot, so actually will take a moment to sort out. They're going to call the basic spot where the infraction occurred. And they'll do some pointing and mathematical computations and figure it out with 7.29 to go. If you are Jim Martin, the athletic director and head football coach of Tuskegee, boy, oh boy, are you satisfied with the way things are right now? No doubt about it. This ball club is hung in there. They played good defense. The momentum has switched to their side some. They moved the ball. They got it down inside the 10. Weren't able to push it in, but they're still in the ball game. The ball game is anybody's game right now. They're just three points down. Touchdown, I put, a, put them up by three. Tuskegee's young, they're big on the offensive line, they're feisty, they want to win. So Florida and them better put them away, or it's going to be a long afternoon. Or evening. The kid knows, he has to, that uh, a pass here, a pass there. He's had three wide open receivers for touchdowns overshot by Antoine Tony Azell. But the law of averages, sooner or later, will catch up as you know all too well. Oh, yeah, you have those days. <laughs> but right now, Tony's just fundamentally not doing the things right. And it's hurting the ball club. I'm Paul Kennedy, along with former Florida A&M All-American Al Chester. It's first and 10 Tuskegee. And Hurd is airing it out. And he overshoots Holder. If he gets Holder in man coverage, and he did there on Petey Evers, why not throw it up there? He already has one huge reception tonight of 45 yards by uh, Holder. And Hurt has completed three of nine attempts for 61 yards. Holder is a big receiver compared to our, our small defensive back out there. And they like to play a lot of man-to-man, -man, which is good. That means that uh, you got to be a better athlete than the guy you're covering. And uh, Ken Riley has that kind of confidence in his players. And Hurt has an arm, too. Second and five. The second leg knocked him off his feet. As Wilson goes down, it was Daryl Davis who applied the hit. Daryl Davis right there worked out so hard during the offseason that not only did he add 15 pounds to that hawking frame, but he's in such great shape. Even though he got bigger, he got faster. That's outstanding. The kids worked out real hard this summer. And... Uh, as a result, they're going to be final ball players. He went from a 4 9 40 to a 4 7 5 40. Tell me how he did that. The screen to this side. And Wilson was covered well by the linebacker and Keith Austin. And Hurd had nowhere to throw. And Austin is saying, or rather, Hurd, the quarterback, is complaining that Austin, the linebacker, had held up the running back. 
the punting situation. Let's see if there's Maurice Scott, the defensive end applying pressure. Let's see if Keith Benton can get one off cleanly to Huckabee. Barely. Huckabee lets it bound inside the 50, and it rolls and rolls and rolls. And will be down all the way back at the 33-yard line. It's a 52-yard kick. And when you open up the papers on Sunday morning across America, readers will believe that Keith Benton is the second coming of Ray Guy. I tell you, this kid is punching a bunch of knuckleballs downfield, but I believe it's by design. I think they're trying to keep the ball away from Huckleby, who, uh, as we stated earlier, had so much success running punts last year. He's an All-American. He broke the Division I AA record last year, and, and uh, how they saw it after. Huckabee does not have a reception and has not returned a punt. He hasn't touched the football. Kind of tough when you don't have it. Tony Izell does now, though, and that offense is explosive. Yet that mirrors his first half frustrations. Exactly. You got to have a lead like Huckabee. You want to try to get the ball in his hand as often as possible. They tried to run a reverse with him. They tried to throw passes to him. Looks like uh, Tony didn't quite get the snap, and as a result, fumbled, but he was able to recover. Probably a little anticipation, trying to get out, the center trying to anticipate the guy in front of him. A little frustrations, first half frustrations, first game jitters. Tony's got to settle down, do all the mechanical things right. Second and 10, operating from his 34 yard line and looking to go to the air. Get down the field. James Thurman, the intended receiver, the redshirt freshman. Maurice Buford, a freshman cornerback there, number 28, from Lakeland, Florida, with contact. The flag immediately as the players went up and pass interference indeed the call. You see Thurman lined up outside. He runs just a simple, quick look in on the hash mark. And Tony lays it up for him. Defensive back kind of gets in there a little bit before the ball comes and makes contact and we get uh, we get a break that we need. Another look from a different angle. You see the contact right before the ball gets there. And the flag goes in. It's marched out to the 48-yard line, and the toss comes back. Romero Sewell picks it up, takes two, three hits, and a low yardage. Amira Sewell was lucky that the ball bounced the right way. Gerald Gibson was there along with 55 Howard Long. Simple toss, sweep right. This kid is really impressing me, though. He's got a lot of speed. He's one of the four fastest guys on this ball club. He turned uh, a play that probably would have been disaster into uh, a non-productive game, but it was all positive. We didn't lose the football. Those Golden Tigers, they're sticking those headgears in there, too. Five minutes to go in the first half. Second and 13 after the loss of three. They set up the screen and last four. the ball to Rasul, who uh, the turn to take the screen, get a, a little shade block there from the big tackle. And the rest of it is just all natural ability. He just spoke of his speed, he turns on the speed. And this kid runs a 4 3 5 40. Excellent execution, determination to get in the end zone, long overdue for the night. A 55-yard touchdown from Christian Petrillo, the extra point. And the score swells to 13 to 3. 40 to go in the first half here at Black Stadium in Tallahassee, Florida. This is Sunshine Network, Florida. On the receiving end. 
Right now, Paul Rasul is the, the player of the game. He's got three receptions for 65 yards, eight rushes for 49 yards. And again, you can see a, a ground level shot of his speed and his determination to get in the end zone. 55 yard TD reception is Azel to Rasul. Didn't take long, did it? It's long overdue. <laughs> this player's been knocking on the door all night. About time to kick it in. Sutton to return. That man there, number three, Orlando Robinson, the freshman. Louisiana native for Tuskegee. And the final step of the 13, Jimmy Bertuno. This is Holder. And up man. Comes back the other way. Owen Rogers. A linebacker and on special teams. And the tackle after an eight-yard return by Christopher Holder. Talked about it earlier, Paul. These guys are executing so well on special teams. He maintained his, his coverage in his lane. So consequently, he's right there to make the tackle. Four and a half minutes away from the end of the first half. Holder, motion to the top of your screen. Murray Sir pitches a deep back to the tailback Mason Wilson against the throw to the center of the field. And wrapped up and taken down by the right end, the sophomore, and six foot three inch, 230 pound, James McDuffie from Killian High School in Miami, Florida. One of the advantages, Paul, for having that tailback so deep is to give him an opportunity to cut back. These backs are slashing runners, and uh, as you see just then, he just slashed back. He's got 10 rushes for 44 yards, which is a decent night for the first half. Holder to the top of your screen. And they've been Pearson, number 18, a freshman to the bottom. The counter. Shoulders at 264 pounds is not quick enough to find a hole on a quick hitting play. That defensive line's not giving up anything inside. The guys are tough, they're swelling up, they got the momentum back now, we scored a touchdown. That three minutes before half, they want to get the ball back to the offense. It's gonna to be tough to move the ball inside. If I was uh, Coach Martin, I would try to put that ball in there right about now, and try to isolate one-on-one. -on -one. James McDuffie, out the stop. Sail beneath the three-minute mark on third and six. Four-man pass run. Heard with time. Overshoots the tight end, Dedrick Streeter. Streeter was coming back for the football at midfield, and it was too high. Looks like they had a little confusion on the pass route there. Uh, uh, Hurt was trying to throw the ball deep. As you can see, Hurt drops back. It's a straight fly pattern with the receiver there. He throws it up in there, and, and uh, I believe the receiver thought he had a comeback route. Consequently, he stops short. The ball's high. Gives everybody a time to break on the football. And little 5'9", Lowell Crawford was the cornerback defending on the play. Huckabee trying to run it down. And has to let it lie there, where it will be down at the 35-yard line. A 36-yard punt without a return. Ken Riley's offense will be back on the attack. With 2.42 to go, and hoping to expand on a 10-point lead as the first half ends. Paul, I think that uh, Huckabee is going to experience all night uh, the type of uh, punting the ball away from him all night. He's going to get that here at Tuskegee. He's going to probably get that all season long. Nobody wants to punt the ball to Huckabee. What Ezell has to do now is execute well, do all the fundamental things right, sit in there, get his feet right, and execute throwing the football. Daniel and Huckabee to the right side of the field, looking for the fella who rambled 55 yards for a touchdown the last time he touched the ball. And Amir Rasul, Ezell comes up empty-handed. It's second down, and the clock is stopped with 2.37 remaining. Rasul is definitely the work, workhorse tonight. They're trying to keep him hot. He's hot. Keep giving the ball. Let him work with it. They're trying to throw it to him. They want to hand it off to him. And you'll probably see that uh, all the way to halftime here. Four man pass rush. Three folks out for pattern. Incomplete. 
the umpire Doc Graham from Daytona Beach. The umpire was in the way. He was one of the intended receivers, I believe, there, incomplete. Third and fifth. But again, Paul, he was trying to go to Rasul. He's a hot man. But again, Tony's not doing all the fundamental things right. He's not gathering his feet, standing tall, and delivering. As a result, we got a new quarterback in the game, Rod Jackson from Jacksonville, Florida. Rivald High School there, where you played. All of five foot nine inches tall. Up to the line. The hole for Jonathan Jones. And Jones pounds it out and comes up four yards shy. Make that move. Take another look at this. About a yard shy of a first down. It's fourth down. Ken Riley says kick it away. As we look at it again, the first snap for Rod Jackson, the freshman. Or the junior, rather. And it's to Jones. They put it on the ground after three incomplete passes. The first punt of the night from Florida a and m And it's Hall, who sends it very high into the sky against an 11-man rush. No one deep for Tuskegee. The ball down at the 16-yard line with 95 seconds remaining. A 48-yard effort by Craig Hall, the sophomore from Tallahassee. Maurice Hurd has the play. Down 13 to three, a minute and a half to go, Al. What you want to try to do now is run underneath routes, clear out routes. and m is going to probably give, give you the man-to-man -man defense. They'll probably play a little sky, a little cloud defense with the two deep safeties. What you want to do is try to throw underneath, in the hole, sit down, and just move the football. Be an excellent time to run a draw, middle screen. Zell in business. Or Maurice Hurd in business, rather. And Wilson. Not run out of the tackle. Applied by Keith Austin, the outside linebacker, who had him by the jersey. And it appears from this point, their timeouts having all been utilized, that they're fully willing to kill the clock. Probably so. Uh, not real happy with a 13-3 deficit but I think they'd rather go in at half knowing they can rebound the second half. They don't want to make any mistakes, give the Rallies the football back. The Rallies are just hurting themselves. Young ball club like this, let's see what they do. Boom. Is Florida A&M call timeout here, you think? With 45 seconds to play? Yes, they do. Timeout, Florida A&M. For in this situation, Tuskegee does not earn the first down. They have to kick it away. And you got to kick it to Huckabee. And although somewhat erratic, Florida A&M's field goal specialist and Jimmy Bertuno does have a leg. Major League Baseball. The Indians and the Baltimore Orioles desperate to stay in first. They've been caught by Toronto. Monday, September 4th, join us from Memorial Stadium on 33rd Street in Baltimore. The first pitch coming at you. The birds in the tribe at 7.30 right here on the Sunshine Network. In the third quarter, A&M clinging to a 7-3 advantage over favored LSU at Kyle Field. Duke trailing homestanding South Carolina at williams Bryce Stadium. Mississippi State, Rocky Falkers Ball Club, leading Watson Brown and the Commodores by a touchdown. And the Big Orange of Tennessee in Earl Bruce's debut at Colorado State by a touchdown. The Bears over the Raiders. And the Bucks in Cleveland tied. I wonder if Gene Deckerhoff made it there on time. No score between Pittsburgh and the Giants. <laughs> And here it is Florida A&M, although leading by 10, Ken Riley cannot be totally satisfied. 
with the results from the first two quarters of opening night 1989. This ball club has been moving the ball up and down the field but just cannot punch it in. Right now, uh, Ezell is not doing the fundamental things right, so Ken's not happy with him right now. A pretty big snap here. Although late, Wilson in motion, third and seven. The blitz is on. Her fires and complete. That stops the clock. That's as effective as a timeout. The Rallies will get a chance to get the ball back and hopefully come up with, uh, with an opportunity to kick a field goal. Howard Huckabee, who's yet to touch the ball on the receiving end of a pass or on the receiving end of a punt return, is on the field. And we have an injured Radler laying out there as well. The left tackle, Jonathan Borden, the sophomore from Birmingham, Alabama, being attended to. Borden, a big guy, 290 pounds, and as you can see, they were looking at that right leg, and fortunately for Jonathan, he's back up under his own power and jogging to the sideline. He has a brace on his left leg. That wasn't the one they were attending to. Florida A&M has one timeout remaining. Tuskegee has used all three. That's the timeline. Keith Benton the punt against a nine-man rush, angling it for the sidelines. It will be a very short kick inside the 40. It'll be marked out of bounds at the 38-yard line. Rather than give it to Huckabee, he was willing to just diagonally kick it out of bounds. Paul, that's just as good as a return. I don't think he meant to kick it out uh, that short of <laughs> distance. But uh, at the same time, had he punched it in the Huckabee, Huckabee probably uh, got a decent return. That's like the legendary stories of walking Ted Williams with the bases loaded and doing so intentionally rather than to have a pitch to it. That's a 17-yard punt. And now Huckabee in motion, as are the Rattlers. Azell, look at his way, and he stumbles at the 18-yard line. Inadvertent contact as he ran up the back of the defensive back and Eddie Kaysen, the sophomore. There has to be intent to impede, and there was not when their feet became entangled. Well, Rod Jackson is an unheralded quarterback out of Rebound High School, has a powerful arm, and uh, just displayed some of his talents uh, in that last play. Yeah, I'm glad you, you corrected me there, calling me Zell. It is indeed Rod Jackson on the move. at the 35-yard line. 19 seconds to go. Don't go anywhere. A lot of action left here in the waiting moments. And then a super halftime show awaits. Stacy Straces, our hostess. Live from the Bicentennial Parade on France, the Marching 100 in Florida a &M. Jackson to the air. Huckabee is open. Tim Daniels. Huckabee ran free down the middle of the field. But Daniel, who was covered, made a tremendous over-the-shoulder catch for the score. See, the receiver's isolated here. Huckabee is in the slot. Both guys were going deep routes. Rod Jackson did a super job getting his high and outside. And the freshman, Tim Daniels, makes an outstanding grab here. In his hands, beautiful catch, well executed. Two touchdowns within the last four look. minutes. Another look at it. Rod Jackson lays that ball. Good tight spiral. And the freshman Tim Daniels make a great grab. Bertuno nails the point after, and with 11 seconds remaining, it's a 20 to 3 football game. Three plays, the biggest of which is the 38 yard strike. 
to Tim Daniel. That's his first collegiate reception. It goes for a score, the redshirt freshman. And the very first touchdown pass in the career of one Rod Jackson from Jacksonville. Tuskegee, which had played without disaster occurring throughout most of the first half, sees the roof fall in in the final moment. Fortuno skips it along the ground. Holden goes down two. Jim Martin's team unable to kill the clock when he wanted to, and it cost him another touchdown. Exactly. Tuskegee wanted to get a couple of first downs, going at halftime with a 13 to three, leading 13 to three. Going unable to do that, Rattles got the ball back executed, made a touchdown, now the score is up 20 to three. Earlier today, I talked to offensive coordinator Kent Schoolfield and asked him if his offense was capable of scoring 50 points. He indicated that they were. They could have had 50 in the first half here had they been clicking. As we know, they can. That's the end of the first half. Your score, Florida a and 20, Tuskegee 3. And the home folks like it a lot more now than they did just moments ago. We'll return to Bragg Stadium at our halftime. The standard band is keeping the fans in the stands at halftime. This pulsating carnival of color is ex extremely popular here in Tallahassee from their fancy footwork to the way they select soulful music. This marching 100 band was selected to represent the United States in Paris' Bastille Day Parade where they wound up the feature act. So sit back. Well, you might want to get on your feet and get in the groove yourself. Either way, you're going to enjoy this performance by this boom box on 500 feet and then some.
to Marseille, as they did in Paris, France, at the bicentennial celebration when they there formed the Tour de Eiffel, the Eiffel Tower. Dr. Frederick Humphreys, the president of Florida A&M, addressing this crowd of close to 30,000. Let's listen in.
Memorial Stadium, the Marching 100, and coming up still in the half, we'll have interviews with Dr. Frederick Humphreys, president of Florida A&M University, and we'll meet Dr. Walter Reed, athletic director of the Rattlers. We'll be back right after this. See, aside from attracting outstanding athletes, you're also attracting outstanding academic achievers. Yes, we are, and we're very proud of that fact. Uh, last year, we were number five in the nation in terms of attracting national achievement scholars to Florida A&M University. We expect to do better this year. We expect to be even higher. Well, the Marching 100's performance in Paris certainly provided a priceless promotion for the university. Have you had an increase in inquiries because of them? We certainly have, and, and you can see this crowd tonight. Uh, we think this crowd is partially due to the fact that we had the Marching 100 America's Band out here tonight, and they have attracted the interest on the part of students from all over the country have been applying to the university, and we have the largest freshman class that we ever had, and we have a record enrollment this year, over 7,300 students enrolled at Florida A&M University. Well, Dr. William Foster has been uh, directing Florida A&M fans since 1946, and I understand that you have an em eminent scholar chair uh, right now in the process of being funded for him. Can you tell us about that? We're trying to raise this year $600,000 for an eminent scholar chair in the name of Dr. William Patrick Foster. Uh, we are asking our friends and our alumni to contribute $120 so that we can get this chair. We don't want a single donor to do it. We want the people of Florida, our alumni, and our friends to show their expression of support for that because William Patrick Foster is a monument in Florida. He's a monument here at Florida A&M University, and he brought us all a great deal of pride. You most certainly did. Dr. Uh, Humphrey, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us and to be here with the FAMU and the Marching 100. Dr. Dr. Frederick Humphreys, president of Florida A&M University. Paul? Thank you very much, Stacy. You see the score, 20 to 3. Florida A&M on the sake of two last-minute touchdowns in the first half, leading the visiting Tigers. And in a moment, we'll have the highlights from the first half of this one. But earlier today, prior to this evening's kickoff, Stacy visited with Dr. Walter Reed, the athletic director of Florida A&M. Let's join him. Joining us down on the field is Dr. Walter Reed, Athletic Director of the Florida A&M University. Dr. Reed came from Jackson State with an impressive record of success. And the 1988-89 season was his first season with the Rattlers, and already you've achieved some incredible athletic uh, statistics. Yes, we were fairly successful last year in that uh, we were able to win the All Sports Trophy, which indicates that you had the best athletic program men-wise in the MEAC. We were second in the country as it relates to 1AA in attendance. Uh, we just felt like that we had a successful year, that we set a record here at homecoming as it relates to attendance. I think we set an all-time Florida a &M University record as it relates to attending football games. We're real proud of that. Well, recruiting must be one of your keys to success. Why are the athletes signing with FAMU? Well, we have found out that a lot of, our, of the uh, black athletes are coming back to the historically black colleges because they are finding out that the historically black colleges are interested in, in making sure that they obtain the education. If they are looking at a professional career, they are finding out that uh, our athletes have a lot of success as it relates to going into the NFL, the NBA, and the and major leagues. We are real proud of the 
three kids that we have in the majors right now. We have one with Montreal, one with Chicago Cubs, and one with the St. Louis Cardinals. We are real proud of that. I'm not, I can't even name the football players we have in the NFL. Well, Dr. Reed, what type of identity is your athletic program striving to achieve? Well, we want to we want to achieve national identity. We want to be known nationally like Florida A&M was known back in the uh, Jake Gaither era. And I think that one step towards achieving that was when we were picked number 15th in the nation in 1AA in the preseason poll. We are real proud of that, and we know it's something that we got to live up to, and that's something that we're going to work towards. Well, an athletic department is run very much like a business. Black ink is necessary in order to survive. How has FAMU's credibility and salesmanship helped you in uh, raising your fund raising efforts? Well, we have one of the number one booster clubs in the country, and we got the, uh, the best marketing and promotion guy in the country, Eric Reinhardt. He does an excellent job as it relates to making sure that we get those dollars that will help us be in the black, and our fans have been real good in coming out in record number and, and uh, supporting us, so therefore we feel real proud. We feel that we'll be in the black from now on. All right, Dr. Reed, thank you very much for stopping by. Dr. Walter Reed, Athletic Director of Florida A&M University. Well, thank you very much, Stacy. Here at halftime, you see the score, 20 to 3. That was the case here in Bragg Stadium. But earlier today, over in Jacksonville, a major upset. As we go to the Gator Bowl for Southern Mrs. Shocker over Florida State. The 21st meeting between Florida State and Southern Mississippi taking place in the Gator Bowl. First quarter, Florida State goes 85 yards in five plays. Dexter Carter, the final 11. The Seminoles lead 7 to nothing. Still in the first quarter, place kicker Bill Mason with the field goal from 24 yards out. Florida State builds its lead to 10 to nothing. Late in the period, Southern Mississippi gets on the board as freshman place kicker Chuck Davis boots this field goal from 22 yards out. Florida State's lead trimmed to 10 to 3. The Golden Eagles would strike for a pair of scores in the second quarter. Tailback Eddie Ray Jackson from three yards out. He ties the score at 10 all. Then junior quarterback Brett Favre, a superb QB, connecting with wide receiver Alfred Williams on this nine-yard touchdown strike. The men from Hattiesburg leading sixth-ranked Florida State 17-10 at the half. The Seminoles come out smoking in the third quarter. Quarterback Peter Tom Willis finds wide receiver Lawrence Darcy in the corner of the end zone. The Knolls go 67 yards in eight plays to tie it at 17-0. After a Golden Eagle fumble at the 17, the Knolls get this nine-yard touchdown run out of Dexter Carter, his second. Bill Mason's extra point missed wide left, but Florida State had regained the lead 23-17 in the fourth quarter. Mississippi, Southern Mississippi traveling 76 yards in seven plays. Ricky Bradley finds the corner from nine yards out. Florida State regains the lead when Bill Mason makes good on this attempt from 27 yards away. FSU 26-24. And then late in the game, the clincher, quarterback Brett Favre finding Anthony Harris all alone in the end zone. The two-yard scoring play, the game winner, as the Golden Eagles knock off the Seminoles 30 to 26. We're live back here in Bragg Stadium, along with former Florida A&M All-American quarterback Al Chester and our sideline reporter Stacy Stracis. I'm Paul Kennedy. And Al, here comes half number two on opening night. And for the green and orange, well, they're just darn glad that the first half turned out the way it did. I'm, sh I'm sure they are, Paul. What they've done, they've executed real well the first half, just couldn't punch it in and score touchdowns. Right there near the tail end, they were able to score a couple of TDs and get away, uh, uh, increase that margin away from Tuskegee. Tuskegee is a feisty ball club. They're young, and they can get it done. The game is not over just yet. Again taken by an up man. And breaking free for FAMU. It's Gerald McCullough. And McCullum, a defensive back out of Warner Robins, Georgia, knew what he had to do when he scooped up the football. He comes rambling down the boundary, 27 yards. It's a first down. And just as he finished the first half, Rod Jackson at 5'9". The quarterback will open here in the third quarter as we get another look at the fine return by Jared McCullum. That's what happens uh, when you try to keep the ball away from Huckleby. He's trying to... We have that kick, and Huckleby uh, was deep. Got out front, picked the ball up, and executed real well, and almost broke it for a touchdown. That was not, uh, well, it was Jared McCullum. I make sure there, I thought for a moment it might have been Marty Lee. We are having trouble with the scoreboard clock. There are 15 minutes, as you know, in a quarter. The clock went the wrong way when the second half began. 
started adding time rather than subtracting it. There's a young man who is the focus of attention, the electric clock operator. And Ken Riley, playing at his alma mater in the 60s. You know, he squared off against Tuskegee's Jim Martin when Coach Martin was playing at Alabama A&M in their playing days. Great rivalry there. On the pitch, Amir Rasul. And Rasul drives inside the 35, down to the 31-yard line. Oh, that was very well executed. All Rod did was just run a, a straight option there. And once the defensive end breaks contain, you don't have to take it down to him. He just pitches right then. The back was able to break contain and, and come up with a good eight, seven, eight-yard game. Amir Rasul, yeah, with a great first half, too. 55 yards rushing. Off the left side. For a tough three or four, Jonathan Jones, the senior. It's just like a little slant dive there. A lot of movement on the offensive line. The, the play can't help but pick up four or five yards. Excellent execution. Offensive line are real intense, and they're getting the job done tonight. And it's a first down. First and ten. It's a gain of six. Two snaps, 14 yards netted. For Florida had it. The tail and to bounce to the outside and then accelerate. He demonstrated his quick feet, his excellent speed. He's hot today. He's the workhorse. The first half, he's been the workhorse. He, he had more 55-yard uh, rushing. He had 63 yards in, in reception. He's getting it done tonight. When the guy's hot like that, Paul, you just keep giving it to him. Howard Huckabee, who can't get the football tonight, runs out of the bottom of your picture. Tim Daniel, who caught the touchdown strike from Rod Jackson to end the first half of the time. Off, cradled by Jonathan Jones. And he's hit a couple of times. Arthur Spencer, the right end, the sophomore, who recorded 23 tackles a year ago, will make this one here. It's a good shot here. It's a slant dive. Uh, good movement on the ball. Picks up two or three good yards. The brothers have a second in about seven, eight. Jonathan Jones, a former lineman. He loves to carry the ball, though. Knows what to do with it. Is Rasul. John Milbury, the left end at 6'2", 275, was at the bottom of the pile, the nose tackle. You see him playing over the center. What the Rallies have to do inside the 20-yard line is really concentrate on what the jobs are, get it done, and punch it in the end zone. I think they can run this ball, Paul, right in the end zone. Exclusively on the ground, but now at third and six. Against the grain, Jackson spinning. Throw it, touchdown! <laughs> Troy Allen, the tight end, the senior, calls in his first touchdown pass of his career. Rod Jackson was excellent executing. He got his shoulder square, and all he did was just toss it over the head, good over the shoulder pass, got made an excellent catch, and now that's all we need. Good, solid execution. It's 26 to three now, and make that 27 to three. And how about Rod Jackson? He has two completions in this 89 campaign. They've both gone for touchdowns. Rod, let's get another look here. You can see Rod sprinting out to his left with it being a right-handed pass. He's got a square that shoulder, zip the ball out, right over the shoulder. Excellent catch. Big Troy Allen makes a great catch. Allen, a senior, has one tonight, as does Timmy Daniel. Allen from Alberton, Georgia. Alberton County High School. A potential all MEAC selection in the eyes of many at the outset of this year. Prototypical size for a tight end. 
no question, uh, Paul, he's a prototype being at 6'4", 230 pounds, he's got good speed, and just demonstrated some excellent hands. They're set to go again. If this keeps up, the way Jimmy Vertuno has been attempting field goals early and then adding extra points as of late on a warm night, he could kick himself into exhaustion. Exactly. He needs the workout, though, I tell you. <laughs> those kickers uh, have to execute. They don't get on the field too often when the scores aren't big, so tonight will be a good night for him to showcase his, showcase his talents. Three touchdowns in the last six minutes. Eric Ravel with interference. Pretty good return out across the 35, the 40, 41 yard line. Excellent return. I still say the Rattlers are executing well. They're staying in their lanes and the guys are uh, pursuing well. They look good on it. Even though the guy picked up uh, 20, 30 yards on the return, it's excellent job, excellent execution. The Rattlers definitely have the tempo right now. Tuskegee behind the eight ball. Let's see what kind of offense they come up with. Let's see how, how they execute. It's a young, fresh team. Their first possession in the second half. in motion is Christopher Holder. Hurd. Complete. To Mark Lee, the Lakeland, Florida native, the split end. And Lowell Crawford, the senior right corner. And on the snap. The gain on the play is good for seven. Well, that's one of the toughest uh, patterns to defend in man-to-man -man coverage is that comeback. Notice the receiver makes a deep curl. Here we go. We drop back. You can't see the receiver, but he's turning in, and he's coming back to the football, catches the ball in his chest. But our defensive back makes the tackle. It's tough, tough to cover, man to man. Second down, and call it three. Mason Wilson, who had a big first half, dives over the line of scrimmage, the junior. And into a hit of Rattlers. Paul, I think that uh, Maurice Hurd has experienced some cramps. He's, uh, he's stretching himself out pretty good. I think this heat and perspiration is really getting to him. It looks like he's cramping up in uh, his hamstrings. With him out of the ball game, Tuskegee's in big trouble. He is definitely by far the firepower. <laughs> and that quarterback now is Philip Johnson. He's 5'11", 182 pound. Freshman from Detroit, Michigan. Another of these 18-year-olds that were loaded up on the team box. And Junior Mason Wilson takes the big hit. Chris Blow, the right inside linebacker, with a solid tackle. Hold on, hold on. Trying to double team the guard there and blue filled the hole tremendously Paul, all you can see is orange helmets is swarming the ball it's probably the type of defense that uh, the D coordinator expects he wants them to swarm the football right, that's go, exactly what they're doing we told you that at least one freshman was on the two deep at every position. Here's a perfect example of that in this Philip Johnson. And the fact that Jim Martin, not to play the party line here, the fact that he has brought this squad in here and they have played respectably well against Florida A&M with truly a busload of 18-year-olds is a credit to the preparation and confidence that he and his staff were able to instill in these kids. That's a mark of excellence by his ball club and his, his coaching staff. This kid, I'm sure, had no idea he would be playing here in the third quarter against the Rattlers. Against Florida A&M in Bragg Stadium. Holder in motion. Movement prior to the snap. The deep push. The tackle. The big hit by Famuse Craig Hall, the sophomore defensive back. A tremendous tackle. Just a side note, uh, Paul Craig used to be a quarterback. That was an outstanding hit for a former quarterback. Here's a guy that stands about 6'3", 210 pounds, and he hit that guy like he'd been playing defense for a long time. Now, don't forget about the flag. And it's against Florida a &F. You see that it appears Maurice Hurd is suffering from cramps. They're giving him fluid and trying to stretch those hamstrings and calf muscles out. 
pretty typical in this kind of weather. When it's hot like this and the guy's working like he's working, I want to be careful of dehydrating. It's probably a lack of salt in the body. The young freshman is not is doing an admirable job. Well, Thune Cookman had all kinds of trouble last night with cramps and the heat in Orlando and their win over UCF. Intended for a holder, and the pass nowhere near it. William Petey Evers, number 17. There defensively. We haven't talked a lot about Petey this evening, but uh, he is uh, truly the anchor of that Florida A&M secondary. There you see him there. Uh, a guy they say is Ken Riley's golden boy. He can do no wrong. Petey kind of reminds Ken of himself, I think. He's, he's a small guy, not real big. He's a technician. He can play man coverage, and he's doing a super job. On second and five, loose ball. And he got it back. Stumbling coming out of center, and this being his first varsity experience, the Michigander is growing up in a hurry when you're having 270 pound linemen coming after you in a mean mood and taking licks like the one applied there from Marcus Boston the fine outside linebacker you'll grow up in a hurry a little freshman quarterback's excited about playing well he stumbled over his uh, one of the linemen's foot and then that didn't help and he's got to get himself together get his composure together he'll be okay lost eight yards in the last two snaps and now five more because he couldn't get the playoff so the cramps suffered by Hurd are costly, not only, as you see her there, trying to get himself back together, but you have Johnson. And also on the sidelines, you have, if you are a Tuskegee backer, another quarterback in Charles Brown, but he, too, is a freshman. Hey, Tuskegee's got a ball club full of freshmen that uh, probably in a couple years is going to be a team to deal with. Jim Martin last year was three and six in a rebuilding campaign following a nine and one season. He trails 27 to three on opening night. We're in the third. Johnson open. Hey, there you go. Complete out of bounds. Christopher Holder, the flanker on the receiving end. The gain of the play is good for 10. And that leaves him still eight yards shy of the first. There's an ISO on the receiver here. The freshman did a super job. You see man coverage there. And all he did was throw an out cut to the slot man. Holder, that's his third reception for 64 yards. The freshman did a super job getting that ball out there. The Rattlers, I'm sure, are really trying to intimidate this kid. But he's holding his own. Great grab, Mark Lee. At the 25-yard line. That's a big league catch for the junior who stretched that six foot frame all the way out to haul it in. And suddenly Philip Johnson has some composure at quarterback. Mark Lee did a super job helping out the freshman that time. The ball was a little high. He was able to sail it. You see him jump real high, show his athletic ability and come down uh, with, a, with a fine catch. A little bit lower and he had have an opportunity to run. On the run here. Going for the end zone, we may have offensive interference. We don't. Mason Wilson ran up Petey Evers' back, <laughs> gave him a shove with both hands. There was no flag. <laughs> Trying to get him out of the way as we take another look. There's no question it was offensive interference. I think uh, the defensive back was where the receiver wanted to go, and as you can see right there, he pushes it. Oh, Petey. <laughs> But the guy still didn't come up with the catch. But he had a little offense interference. Up there. <laughs> Gave him a double shove. To the top of your screen is Orlando Robinson, the freshman. Holder headed that way in motion. Deep toss to Wilson. Trying to turn the corner and out of bounds at the 23-yard line. It'll set up third and seven. With 8-10 remaining. Mason Wilson has gotten a lot of work. Without a doubt, he's a workhorse for Tuskegee. Big back, big strong kid. This team looks a little sluggish, though. Uh, Paul, I believe this weather is starting to slowly get to him. It doesn't help much when you're, when you're down 24 points, either. that 
get tired the fastest are your linemen who are beaten on or pounded, I should say, on every play. And if they wear down and make a mistake, this is what happens. A guy like James McDuffie can get right through there, number 93. I'll tell you, Paul, McDuffie was nice to him because I think he could have put his helmet square in his chest and probably hurt the kid. The second sack recorded by the Rattlers. It's fourth and 16. And Tuskegee, of course, will go for it. They must penetrate the 16-yard line. Cutting that way. He's got Holder. Did Holder make the catch? Let's see. It was close. And no. Out of bounds. Holder went down hard. And is shaken up. He came within inches of holding on to it for the first down. Timeout on the field will step aside as well. 7.23 remaining in the third quarter. FAMU leading 27-3. At Albertson, certified lower prices mean big savings on your grocery bills. Catch the wave and save. Coca-Cola Classic or Diet Coke, just $2.49 for a 12-pack of 12-ounce cans. Get solid savings on fresh cello wrapped lettuce, now just 59 cents a head at Albertson's. Cooking out or in, treat a crowd to Albertson's large meaty pork spare ribs, just 99 cents a pound in the family pack. So when you want to save big on your grocery bills, remember, at Albertson's, we think like you do. It's fueled the victories of Super Bowl champions and Sandlot superstars. It's as welcome on a hot cinder track as a cold sheet of ice. It is unsurpassed at supplying fluids, minerals, and energy. It goes beyond refreshment. It produces results. It's everywhere athletes compete. It's sports. It's Gatorade. Hi, I'm Robert Mitchum. During my career, I've played many Navy roles, so I've seen our Navy up close. Let me tell you, it's a great opportunity for young men and women to be their very best. Quarterback Philip Johnson with touch on the receiving end, Christopher Holder. He gets the foot down, Al, but can't hold on to the ball. Chris Holder runs a, a nice route. He makes a superb effort. Major League effort to catch the ball. It bounces out on him. He got a foot down, but the ball bounced out on him. And he's shaking up a little bit when he hit the turf. Outstanding effort. He's a fine receiver. Indeed he is. And over on downs, Florida A&M with possession. And the lead. The time remaining in the third quarter. The quarterback, Rod Jackson, quick sideline round looking for Huckabee. And Huckabee was open. The pass up and away behind him. Condre Payne, the left cornerback, a sophomore in the vicinity. It's not been Mr. Huckabee's night, and he's had many in this stadium. A fellow who has four punt returns for a touchdown recorded in one season. He returns one more this year. He'll also on the career record. The ability to make people miss. Fullbacks usually don't. Patrick Reddick goes the hard way. Up the middle. The Rellas are probably content now wearing them down and then pull grab it out of the hat and throw the ball downfield a little bit. Every now and then, Tuskegee kind of mixed up the defense. They gave him an eight-man front on first down. Second down, they went too deep with the safeties. It'll be interesting to see how they uh, continue to move, maneuver this thing around. Gain of seven, third and three. Down the line option. And on the run, throwing it complete. An outstanding call in Greg Wynn. Was open the tight end, the sophomore. And Rod Jackson. Has to walk back to the bench and talk to his offensive coordinator about this. Here is a dab option pass where it's a read route. The tight end is wide open. The monster stays with the tight end. Of course, you run the option. The monster came up for the play. Tight end broke free. Rod tried to hit him and overshot him a little bit. Hunting situation. Craig Hall to handle the charge. Flag down. Low snap. He scoops it up. Comes this way. Has the first down. Then loses the ball back near the first down marker. 
one yard line. We will first see what the flag is about. For it came along the line of scrimmage, then the low snap, and good athleticism here. They had a blow through a teammate. To Craig Hall is a former quarterback, so it's nothing uh, new to him to pick that ball up and run it. He's a big kid. He's, he's much stronger now than he was a couple years ago. Playing defensive back, he's tough. He doesn't have a problem picking that ball up and running, but he did an excellent job. Then just needs to tuck that ball away. He had the first down, from the ball, and let it get away. Rush hour traffic in Manhattan. For referee Jim Askew, he takes an official timeout. Procedure. The call against Florida AM. Now what they have to decide is whether or not that's a first down. If it's not, then Tuskegee declines the penalty and takes over at the Florida AM 41-yard line. AAU USA Basketball tomorrow, September 3rd, the girls' championships at 8 o'clock Eastern. The men to follow on Labor Day evening at 10.30. Hope you can join us right here on the Sunshine Network. In the fourth quarter, Texas A&M stalking a major upset against the Bayou Bengals of LSU. Duke trailing South Carolina in the second half. Vanderbilt sees Mississippi State pulling away in Starkville. Bruce is playing Johnny Major's Vols tough as the Rams invade Knoxville. And in the NFL, the Bears and the Raiders. Hey, Mike Tomczak gets some confidence in the final preseason weekend of football. And here, it's FAMU. It's confidence blossoming after a sluggish start in which it managed to score just six points through the first... 26 minutes of this ball game and then put two quick late first half touchdowns on the board to uh, cool off Ken Riley's temper before he went to the halftime dressing room. Exactly. The Rattlers moved the football up and down the field all the first half. For just some reason, uh, the gun started smoking and they couldn't push it all the way in. Came in there uh, the last few minutes of the second half, able to come up with a couple of TDs and, and try to exploit the, uh, the Tuskegee defense. The penalty situation here, the fact that Craig Hall had indeed earned the first off the scramble from the bad snap. So they take the penalty, march him back five. And this is why the rule book for college football is of encyclopedia thickness for all of these nuances and points of detail. The law reads, you go back five, we do it again. It is fourth down for Florida A&M with six and a half minutes remaining here in the third quarter. And there is Craig Hall. A tumbling punt that bounds at midfield. The Golden Tigers let it go. And it will be down. Oh, that's an elbow for two at the 42-yard line. 27 yards with the roll. As Tuskegee Institute takes over. And back onto the field comes its starting quarterback and Maurice Hurd. With Al Chester, the former All-American quarterback at Florida A&M. We look on and see that in Liberty Bowl Stadium, they're scoreless there. SMU playing college football once again. And Forrest Craig brings up three in his first quarter at his alma mater. Looking for six. Hurt. What a catch at the 26-yard line. A remarkable grab by Chris Holder. You can beat him up, but he comes right back at you. The sophomore from Mobile, Alabama. Chris Holder is just a fine athlete. He's here in the slot. He runs an out and up. And, he, and he's wide open. Somebody failed to pick him up, and uh, the quarterback picked him up. They don't know what the deep zone looked like then. Makes a super catch. This kid is a fine athlete. Only a sophomore. Stands six foot, 172 pounds. Hurt back 
into the game and connects on this 32-yarder. Holder's got uh, four receptions for 96 yards. Superb afternoon. That's a fine grab. That's a major league catch right there. This kid is just a sophomore. Holder went back to the huddle and then laid down, and the trainer is on. I believe Holder fell on that football and knocked the wind out of him. And he had enough to get back to the huddle, and then it just collapsed. You could build a highlight film of his crashes this evening. It's been demolition derby. He's got out of bounds with the bandit, across the middle with the bandit, and we aren't talking about a big brutish guy. It's 170 pounds. But those are big brutish numbers. He's showing some, some excellent athletic skill. And he's a tough guy. He also runs punch back. And uh, he's going to be a kid you're going to have to reckon with for a couple more years. Fine athlete. And Jim Martin is glad to have him. Checking in to replace it is Orlando Robinson, the freshman receiver. Chased out her. Firing. At the goal line, broken up. Intended for Mark Lee. And there defensively is Petey Evers. Right where he needed to be. The pass was well thrown to good position. Erdbone is, uh, is a good quarterback. He can throw that football. What he had then was just straight up man-to-man -man coverage and uh, tried to hit his receiver on a deep out. Maurice Hurd is 6 of 18 for 99 yards, as you see. Mason Wilson away from the football who was in for pass protection. Took a shot. Now we're beginning to see here late in the third quarter the effect that A, a lack of depth and a tremendously hot night in Florida is having on visiting Tuskegee. Here's the herd bone offense of Tuskegee. Drops back. And you saw in the bottom of yeah. your picture, Wilson caught a knee in the ribs. Second down and 10. Holder is back into the game. At the top of your screen. That guy is tough. Here he comes in motion. Drew double coverage. The guy that's going to attract attention. Law Crawford was over there, the cornerback. Against Tuskegee, the procedure call. Holder may have broke toward the line of scrimmage prior to the snap. That's exactly what happened, Paul. He makes runs it out and up and then put forth an effort to try to catch the football. It's no secret that Holder is the main gun. He's a wide receiver and they want to throw the football to him. He can come up with the football. Hurt is two for three in the second half through the air. And he's but six of 18 tonight for 99 yards. Third and 10. The fifth penalty. Wilson. Mason Wilson lined up in the slot. Ran a deep corner. No one picked him up. Safety man got over just in time to swat the ball away. That's freshman William Carroll made a super job. Number 27, freshman out of Mobile, Alabama. Fine job. A redshirt freshman who recovered well. And Florida A&M has called timeout with five minutes and 32 seconds remaining in the third quarter. We'll return to Bragg Stadium in Tallahassee in just a moment. You see the score. Here in the renewal of a rivalry that dates all the way back to 1908 between these two schools. I can remember 
Paul playing Tuskegee, they hit us so hard. These guys <laughs> played over their hands, they hit us so hard, man. And Al Chester, 10 years after the fact, former All-American is still talking about it. Maurice Hurd. Guns it over the middle, Maurice Wilson is there. He takes a pretty hard look at the 16-yard line, close to the first down marker. When you come across the middle against Florida A&M, you best be loaded for bear because you're going to get hit. Many men have uh, come across the middle, been hit, and didn't make it. They never returned. Have to call the meat wagon to come pick him up. Maurice Hurd is a tough athlete. He's performed well uh, all night tonight. Great pass to Mason Wilson, who also has been a workhorse. They'll bring the chains on. And stretch it out. You know, Paul, although uh, AM is, is probably dominating this football game and have been for the most part, uh, Tuskegee, Tuskegee is going to be uh, right in the thick of things, I think, with, in the SIAC. With plays like this, they will. As Wilson, out of the backfield, caught it and earned the first down. Eddie Battle was there, the first rattler. Trailing 27 to 3. And with but one second quarter to field goal. Field goal to show for their offensive scoring this evening. Keith Benton's 25 yarder. Here is Maurice Hurd trying to put seven on the board. Holder in motion. Motion on both sides of the ball. Wilson running as if nearly exhausted works the right side. He will not have any trouble falling asleep on the bus tonight for Tuskegee. One of the things about a freshman ball club is when, when you get this late into the ball game, you're tired, you're behind, you kind of lose a little something. I think Tus Tuskegee's losing a little something. And Ken Riley on the other side of the field still has a couple of waves that he can run at you. We hope you've enjoyed this evening's MEAC and SIAC encounter. The old gold and crimson of Tuskegee and Florida a and M's Rattler. The great of the orange from Tallahassee. Pumping her. Tip. Deflection as the first interception. The pass in and out of the hands of Mark Lee. Here's the second turnover tonight committed by Tuskegee. He got Chris Holder running the out and up, and Hurt decides to go to the Gaddis running inside route. The normal tip drill that the defensive backs work on, all doing practice. Here it is, got to come up with an interception. It's been in the right place at the right time. Excellent hands. In the fourth quarter, R.C. Slocum, following Jackie Sherrill, nears a huge victory in Aggieland. And driving his way across the 10. And up to the 14-yard line uh, for the first time, Alonzo Ashworth, the Tampa Junior, 5'9", 180, carries it for the first time tonight. Here come the waves. That's what we talked about earlier. Ken Riley's got a lot of backs to throw at you, and these guys are getting it done. These guys are big, strong, got good speed. And when you send fresh backs at the, at the defense that's been on the field most of the night, it's tough. Rod Jackson with two touchdown passes to his credit. Still in a quarterback. Working the left side is Patrick Reddick. He played at Lincoln High School right here in this city. And a fellow from Lake City, Florida. And Ronald McGray, the sophomore weak side linebacker, in on the stop. Well, I think it's very interesting, uh, this quarterback situation for Florida a &M. Same thing happened for Rod last year. Uh, Tony wasn't playing well. He got a chance to start, played well, started another game. And then he didn't have a good game, and Tony came back and played well. Third and a yard, and that's the first.
first down easily for Florida A&M as they grind out the middle. And it's Ruddick again to earn the first. Coach Riley had mentioned earlier, back on this quarterback situation, that God had had such an excellent spring that uh, he didn't think his offense would, would lose much if Tony wasn't playing. And as you can see, Rod is having a better night because he's sitting in there doing all the fundamental things that are, that are correct for a quarterback. Tony just rushing himself, not getting his feet together, and ready to pass. Reddick now has rushed for 33 yards. Pounding continues in the middle. Much like two fighters, and you've heard this analogy before. Just keep hitting him in the bread basket, hitting him in the bread basket, working it up the middle of the guard. will drop, but don't be surprised to see Rod Jackson in Florida and in the go airborne. Exactly. I think Ken, his whole approach to this offensive scheme at this time in the game is just to keep punching, keep punching, but all of a sudden he's going to come and play, play pass and go up top, and it's going to be a big six. Second down and five. Late in the third quarter, Florida A&M up 27 to three. Jackson firing. He has it complete to Troy Allen. His tight end who breaks the tackle. Ahead to the 40, the 45 yard line. Artie Smith, the freshman free safety, made the stop, but not before. Florida A&M clicks on this 21-yard gain. Straight drop back pass. Uh, Rod had to spam a little bit. Made a good effort. Squared his shoulders. Got the pass to Troy Allen. Allen demonstrating his ability. Superb effort. Picking up the extra yards. And the linebacker, Roger Hunt, number 54, missed a tackle. On first down. Play action. Did drop. Chin strap came out, his mouthpiece popped out. He got hammered from behind by Earl White, a freshman, strong safety from Detroit. That's how they hit him up there in Michigan. <laughs> the intensity is there uh, by all means because these guys are losing, so uh, Tibbles is going to flare a little bit. I think Huckabee was running a little quick look in route. Uh, Rod fakes uh, to the tail back and tries to hit Hook on a little quick look in, a little high for him. And, Huck got pushed prior to the ball getting there, and as a result, we got the flag. The penalty yards start to mount. Tuskegee's been assessed 55 yards now in penalties, Florida a and but 47. And penalties are a function of fatigue at times. Exactly. Two minutes to go in the third quarter. Quick hitch to the boundary. In and out of the waiting arms of wide receiver Harry Brown, the junior. 6 2 208 from Miami. An ex tight end. You think he's a tight end with that kind of size? He's moving into the split, split end position. He's a big boy. And uh, he should have had that football. Although it was a little high, he should have come up with it. I think he might have been trying to peep that defensive back to see if he was going to get tapped. We've had a player ejection for Tuskegee as referee Jim Askew is sending number 79, John Milbury, out of the game and explaining to Milbury's coach, Jim Martin, why. Paul Milbury is one of the senior leaders. He's a junior leader on that ball club. And... Uh, well, basically, he's a senior compared to all the freshmen you have out there. And, and that kind of activity, uh, displaying uh, poor sportsmanship is not tolerated, I'm sure, at, uh, by the referees or at Tuskegee. Not only do you lose Melbury, but you also lose 15 yards of field position defensively. And Florida A&M has the football first and 10 at the 24-yard line with a commanding 27-3 lead. Florida A&M with 30 yards and penalties on this drive alone. And on the last two snaps, we've had the pass interference. And then the ejection here as Ashwood is tripped up shy of the line of scrimmage. He loses two. Arthur Spencer, the sophomore right in. Got him, number 77. Got some big arms there, doesn't he? 
a big boy. They got some big, meaty people on that defensive line. They got some big ball players. The time remaining in the third quarter in Tallahassee. Jackson got it. Paul, what I'm impressed with is the way Rod Jackson hung in there. He looked left, and he came back right and found the second receiver and pumped it right in there. Super job on the quarterback. Now, of course, the kid made an effort, effortless uh, catch. And he held on to the football despite being hit. The senior from Flint, Michigan, Ravel, 5'9", can deliver a punch. The wishbone treatment for Ashwood. 54 Rogers Hunt along with 90 Cleveland Gibson trying to bend him in two. One thing about it, regardless if you're SIAC, MEAC, Division II, Division I, AA, Division I, football is football. And it's hitting, tackling, and all the basic fundamentals. That's a first down. Kill Still another one on a long drive that began. The bottom of section J. All the way Kill back at the six-yard line. So they're about to go 94 yards the hard way if they punch this one in. Again, Ken Riley's utilizing another freshman back, Marty Lee, 6'1", 220 pounds, who plugs it right in there. And I saw him giving Coach Riley the signal. He wants it again. I can take it in. Four first downs on this march. Aided by those two big penalties. They'll be doing the score, and if that's the case, at the other end of the field. We head to the fourth and final quarter with the score. As we head toward the fourth quarter, Florida a and and Tuskegee from historic Bragg Stadium in Tallahassee, Florida, along with former FAMU great Al Chester and our sideline reporter, Stacy Strasen. I'm Paul Kennedy. Our producer tonight again, Tom Hastings. On second down and three, inside give and tripped up shy of the goal line is Patrick Reddick. For a guy who was at best fourth on the tailback or running back depth chart, Reddick has gotten a lot of carries this evening. Let's count him up here. He had three in the first half for 20 yards. Six more in the second half. He's totaled 46 yards tonight. He's doing a super job. Coach Riley is, is sending those backs in like they're like, some, like it's a meat factory. He's got a bunch of them. And they want to carry the football. Everybody bunched in tightly. It's now first and goal. Go on and there finally. After all that work, Patrick Reddy gets to carry it over the goal line. Reddick punches it in for six. The score swells to 33 to three. You see the power line against a fatigue defense, Al. Exactly. Just like we talked about, the weather's taking its toll on the defensive line of Tuskegee. It's a straight dive in. Gut determination. He wanted it bad. I saw him giving Coach Riley the signal. Give it to me. I want it. He's got it. And Rotaro has his fourth extra point as well. Oh. Flag on the field. Jim Askew's yelled himself points trying to keep control of this one. Apparently, it's against the Rattlers. And of course, says Tuskegee's Gregory Quinn, take him back. go back five and do it again. Jimmy Viterno with two field goals tonight, one of 22 and the other of 30 for the Tallahassee Junior. And then three extra points and here number four to try and do it for a fourth time.
Got to score. Timeout on the field. In fine fashion. Better than 14 minutes remain in the game, but as you can see the score, the Rattlers are dominated. The short kick by Darney Hogan. A backup kicker and reserve defensive back is fielded by linebacker Robert Jeter and on special teams. Look at this drive. A dozen plays, 94 yards. That's 537. Impressive. That's impressive. That's the kind of drive that Ken, Ken Riley and Ken Schoolfield want from their offense. Time-consuming drives, long play drives, and go to distance of the field. They also had the player ejection of 15 yards, and Huckabee nearly decapitated. Cost him 15, so he had 60 yards out of the 94 in penalty. Good take it. Not to say it wouldn't have happened again. Just trying to get away from trouble. And Maurice Hurd throws that one over everybody. It'll be second down. Did you ever have a night like this, Al? When it just seemed to start welling against you? Believe me, you, I have, and it uh, doesn't feel good. Everything that you could, you, you do is wrong just about. Uh, you can't do anything right. You can't score touchdowns. You're the visiting team. <laughs> Believe me, I've been there. It's not a good feeling. You've had some big wins, too, my friend. Win two national titles a decade ago here on this campus. Mason Wilson with surprising spring in his legs. Comes across the 40, the late face mask, the call. William Carroll, two strides out of bounds, grabbed him up in the cage, and you can't even touch it. Well, the referees are taking care of these players this year. I think anything that's close, being flagrant, they're going to call it. The kid should have done was just let him run out of bounds and not even put his hands on him at all. Dead ball, personal foul. 15 yards and a first down. There's another shot at it. It's a good rip, just a straight dive. Make something happen, turns the speed. And he's out of bounds right now. I should let him go. Little tap there, little kiss. <laughs> Referee caught him, though. I don't think I've ever been kissed like that. No kissing out of bounds. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be better nights for Jim Martin. But hey, he's playing a classification above his league here, truly, in 1AA. It's a Division II team. Alabama a and the only other school at this level who'll play this year. Hurried, heard, perhaps hearing footsteps, threw it out of bounds. Pushing and shoving by Florida A&M's James McDuffie. He may have the big lead here of 31 points, but he's still in a foul mood as number 93. I tell you. That's one thing Ken Riley will not be happy with. He's not going to tolerate that. Intensity is still there. There's Coach Ken Riley. Still has the same look he had on his face at the beginning of the game. That's a great poker player. Again, it's just a straight fly route. Uh, the defensive back was beat. Uh, Antoine said to get, got to get behind him, and he came up with a great catch. This kid is a super receiver, and uh, you got to keep your eyes on him. He makes a fine over-the-shoulder grab here. In stride, good route, and he finishes up well. Five receptions for 139 yards, and it's a fake. There's a flag down, too. Tuskegee's holder, Kenneth Melton, Flag on the play. a freshman flanker, perhaps bobbled the snap. Let's see. In the second half, we have been submerged in penalties. Uh -uh. We'll go back, put it on the team. So the strike against Riley's Rattlers enlivens the second half, certainly the fourth quarter. Tuskegee scores its first touchdown of the night. And the score stands, Florida A&M 34. And 
the Rattlers. Yes. And the Golden Tigers from Alabama, nine. And a big night by a big time receiver. How would you like to have a fellow like that on the other end of a. That's every, quarter, that's every quarterback's dream to have a fine class receiver like Chris Holder. Today and tonight, he's actually getting the job done. He's running super routes, he's making the great catches, excellent moves. And he's just a sophomore. That's what's scary. He's got to come back next two years and face these rallies. Four plays, 69 yards, half a minute. Who was the best receiver you ever played with? And don't look at me like that. You furrowed your brown. Well, we were a run-oriented offense, and we had a lot of great receivers. We had uh, uh, Cal Burgess when I was a sophomore who caught the ball well, and Willie Cook. We had uh, uh, Kenny Bogans and, uh, from Jacksonville. We had Wyman Daniels, uh, Bobby Hawkins. We had quite a few receivers who got the job done. We didn't, we didn't showcase our receivers that often, but when we had to put it up, we could put it up with the best of them. Al Chester, former Florida A&M quarterback. In the broadcast booth this evening from Bragg Stadium. 10.39 remaining. And Rogers Hunt sends it end over end. Here comes Huckabee for the first time tonight touching the football. And he's roughly greeted at the 33-yard line. He does not touch the ball until the issue's been decided in the fourth quarter. Eric Ravel on the stop. A&M appears well on its way to the shocking win. South Carolina appears to have that one in hand. So does Mississippi State. Congrats to Rocky Felton. Condolences to Watson Brown and the Commodores. Johnny Majors hanging on at 90,000 seat. Nalem Stadium. and nowhere to go for Jonathan Jones, the fullback, with 13 and a half minutes remaining. And on the stop, Willie Hull, freshman strong safety. We had talked about the youngsters. You have Huff, who's a freshman at strong safety. Artie Smith, a freshman at free safety. Frederick Watts, a freshman at right corner. Only one senior starter this evening for Tuskegee defensively. Rod Jackson backpedaling quickly. The big lead, but they want more. It's Jones out of the backfield. I want to You know, Paul, and, and for all these guys to be freshmen and as young as they are, the Rattlers really haven't exploited them like you uh, would expect uh, a bunch of freshmen to be exploited. Then Rod Jackson uh, just takes a drop back and uh, look downfield, trying to look the safety off. He hits a, his back coming out of the backfield, running a little shoot. Linebacker's there, cornerback comes up to force, and uh, probably a one or two yard pickup. Catch on the run by Famuse David Lucas, the junior from Macon, Georgia. He too had only one grab all last year in his sophomore campaign. The little 5'7 wide receiver equals that total. Rod Jackson on a little waggle, waggle left. He turns that shoulder. He gets he's fundamentally sound. He turns that shoulder, zips that ball out there. The kid is able to make the catch. That is the, probably the most difficult pass to catch is quarterback. Uh, a pass to throw, I mean. Quarterback swinging left, and he's right-handed, squaring those shoulders. Squaring up to the line of scrimmage is Patrick Reddick. Nearly ran out of his jersey at midfield. And into the eye of the Rattler. Huff, the freshman strong safety. Along with Dumas, the left end at 241 pounds on the set. It is second down and seven after the pickup of three. Jackson working on that passing game, guns it all along. Greg Wynn, the tight end. A freight train carrying inside the 40, inside the 30 to the 27 yard line. Cleveland Gibson, the inside linebacker, had to make the tackle. 
Just straight drop back, 10 step drop. Ball looks a safety man off, hits his tight end in the middle of the field. This guy looks like Kevin Winslow. Super job, he tucks the ball. Notice how he tucks that ball right before contact. He won't fumble that football. Good fundamental habits, super job. Watch it again here, Rod. It's a delay, a tight end delay, right across the middle. Watch him grab that football right before contact. He gets what he can. He always ends up north and south, which is the way you want to be. He is shaken up, and Willie Huff is too, the freshman strong safety. We'll step aside. 34 to 9, your score. We're 11 minutes and 26 seconds away from the finish line here at Bragg Stadium. a quarter remaining. The evening belongs to Florida A&M, and the Hungry Rattlers are looking for more. Michael Payne, on the carry Michael Payne the freshman tailback from Mobile, Alabama, and Alba High School, carries it for the first time tonight. And a lot of guys in green jerseys carrying the football. One thing about it, Paul, the, the offense hadn't been stingy. Eight different players have caught passes. Eight different runners have, uh, have run the football tonight. Spread the wealth real, real well. 16 different skilled people. Two different quarterbacks. Greg Wynn, well covered. It stops the clock with 10 minutes and 45 seconds to go. Jackson with some impressive numbers. Rod's doing a super job here tonight. He's, he's fundamentally sound, and that's what's the plus, especially in an opening game like this. Most kids are excited about, about the first game, and they want to hurry and get the ball, which is what Ezel was trying to do. He's got a strong arm, but he wasn't fundamentally sound, wasn't squaring his shoulders, setting his feet. Rod's come in here and done everything right, so consequently he's had a lot of success. A 38-yard strike to Tim Daniel and a touchdown pass to his tight end, Troy Allen. All tonight. He releases, and it falls harmlessly to the turf. The pass sent in the direction of Florida A&M's pain. Again, he had golden tigers all around. Paul, well, I saw him talking to Ken now. Uh, play previous. That's the same play that ran uh, a few seconds ago. And what he wanted to do was try to hit that guy running a deep post in the middle. And that defensive end maintained contain, and he couldn't get outside. Took a good shot. Howard Long, the linebacker, was the last guy there. Jimmy Paterno, who has two field goals already, will attempt here from 40 yards out. He's booted one of 22, the other of 30. And this one doesn't have quite enough leg on it to get there. It's no good. And with 10.31 to go in the football game, the Tigers from Tuskegee will take over. Although trailing 34 to nine, I find it interesting that Coach Riley and the Tigers are likely to stay with their passing game, continue to work at that, rather than running out the waiting moments for awaiting us another member of the MEAC, the Wildcats of a Booth Kirkman College, as we relive a fine win recorded last night in the Sixers Bowl over the Knights of Central Florida. Coming up immediately following this one, Mason Wilson following his blocking. Explodes outside the 25 and up to the 27 yard line. I'll tell you, Paul, right now, Florida a m is, is, is mixing the offense up real well. And so far, with 10 minutes and 13 seconds left to go in the fourth quarter, they've already uh, totaled up 406 yards total offense. I think that's a pretty productive night for three quarters and a couple of minutes, you know? Sounds like one of your old passing nights. I'll tell you. <laughs> Al Chester threw for 407 yards in the route of Grambling. <laughs> It is a great total. Holder in motion. He has the TD reception, as you know. Heard the throw. Looking toward Holder, and he made the catch. The defensive back went for the interception. Slithering past the 35 and up to the 36, 37-yard line. Cedric Jones in on the stop. Eddie Battle thought he could pick it off on the out route. 
And it came up empty-handed. Holder did not. Is her just dropping back, giving a pump fake, throwing the out. Battle goes for the interception and miss. That final receiver comes over the grab and execute a well play. 165 yards on nine catches tonight for Holder. The deep pitch, Wilson having to dip, running out of real estate, and they foreclose on the mortgage at the 42-yard line. He had enough speed to gain three or so out of it. He just wasn't able to quite turn that corner because of the pursuit. I tell you, Paul, this, this ball club, Tuskegee, although the score is not indicative of uh, the way they can play, they're going to be uh, strong contenders in the SIAC. As you mentioned, uh, Florida a is only one of two Division I AA schools that are playing on the schedule. And they just happen to be the first game and the last game. So in, that, in between, these guys are going to get it together. trying to go to the well one more time with the, with the big gun receiver. Laid that ball up a little too long, and it was picked off. His second interception. The third turnover committed by Tuskegee. Excellent run back here, as you see. By a third string defensive back. It's not a bad job. <laughs> They're well into the depth chart on the defensive side of the football. McDuffie with fresh legs. A freshman from Mulberry, Florida, does the Mulberry Shuffle, the 185-pounder, to earn eight. That's the ninth running back tonight for Florida A&M. This play emulates so much the old Washington Redskins counter trade. This guy looks like John Riggins running. <laughs> but he has a better haircut than Rego used to. Eight minutes to go. Back the other way for McDuffie. Stayed out of street pretty well there. After the initial hit by Gregory Quinney and then Howard Long, the linebacker, over. Paul, I tell you, these second and third and fourth string guys uh, trying to set the tone. They want to be a part of this, this ball club. They want to make a contribution to this, this team throughout the season. So tonight's a good night to showcase the talents and let Coach Riley develop and, and feel some confidence with them. That depth is, is really a, a plus for the Rattler football team. Already at the Tuskegee 27, leading 34 to 9. Patrick Reddick with one touchdown to his credit. Works the middle for five. Cleveland Gibson, the right inside linebacker, on the tackle. I think it's also an added plus that uh, Rod Jefferson, Rod Jackson, I'm sorry, is getting his confidence, getting his game play on it. I think he's feeling real good about himself right about now. And the competition at quarterback is what you need. A lot of folks playing. Rod Jackson under center. the intended receiver at the goal line in Tyrone Davis. Tyrone Davis is the seventh wide receiver to come on the field this evening. Well, Tyrone ran a, a nice route. It was a nice post corner and uh, kind of got hung up in the post a little bit and Rod kind of stuck it out there and he wasn't able to catch up with it. Excellent route. Good ball. Right where he should be. Just got stuck in that post and couldn't get out of it. Now the sophomore from Atlanta, Georgia. For the bright future. Third down conversions for Florida AM. The blitz is on. They read it. Missed the linebacker. Missed the interception. Had the perfect play call. The delay blitz. The delay screen. Excellent play. Excellent uh, pass by Rod. I think he might have been up under the ball just a little bit. Greg Wynn is open the tight end and it's off his fingertips as Gibson, the linebacker, was coming. Earl 
White, the strong safety for Tuskegee. Diving, trying to come up with the ball of freshman. The time remaining here in quarter number four on fourth and five. Yes, sir. And drops back and hits the receiver on a little drag, a little fullback, halfback drag. Excellent pass, good reception, and he was hungry for the end zone. He would not be denied. Bounce off his hand. Hit him in a bad spot. Hit him in a bad spot, right in his hand. I think he was looking at the end zone. Take a closer look here. He's trying to go to this big guy there, big receiver there, big tight end. He was watching that end zone. He saw a touchdown. His foot again. Two midfield. Tuskegee's players saying that it inadvertently deflected off a of Florida AM player. The ball will be spotted at midfield. And a final Texas AM has upset LSU and RC Slocum's debut in Aggie Land. South Carolina has beaten Steve Spurrier in the Duke Blue Devils tonight. And Rocky Falker's Bulldogs have pounded SEC rival Vanderbilt. In the fourth, a field goal, the difference between the Bulls and the Rams from the WAC. And it's Ole Miss, hotty toddy, over the Tigers of Memphis State. Bryce laying it on SMU. our third quarterback of the game for Florida A&M. And it's Travis Green, the sophomore, handing inside on first down to Patrick Ruddick for no game. Travis is a kid that's been around a while. He's, uh, he's familiar with the system. He just hadn't had much playing time. Now it's a good chance to give him some opportunity to get some game experience uh, as a backup for Ezell and uh, Rod Jackson. 6'1", 180 pounds, from Lake Gibson High School in Lakeland, Florida. The medal's tough again for Patrick Reddick. Now we see here that perhaps Florida A&M has elected to keep the ball on the ground the final four minutes and ten seconds of tonight's festivities. I don't know, Paul. I wouldn't throw a towel in <laughs> just yet, Biggs. Throw the towel in. 41 to 9 the score, and a former Rattler All-American quarterback up here is ready to strike again. Exactly. Kill a mosquito with an axe. <laughs> He neared the first down marker. Earl White, the strong safety, with a solid stop. Number 10 earned a 10 on that tackle. It's fourth down. He came up short. And Ken Riley, even though he stands at the Tuskegee, 41 and needs but inches has apparently sent in the punting team and this is Ken Riley the merciful with 307 to go His team has performed well tonight, especially the second half. They look like a football team and uh, When they're gunned up and, and ready to go if they play like this the first half uh, the score could be 6 to nothing, 6 to 9, just as easy. Craig Hall, the sophomore, boots at 41 yards. It rolls into the end zone, will be brought out to the 20, and then 21 yard effort. And just 2 minutes and 54 seconds separate that gentleman and his Rattlers from their very first victory here in 1989. Next up for Florida AM in two weeks. I'll go to Jacksonville 
What a game this ought to be. Eric Russell and the Eagles of Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern traditionally has had a fine football team throughout the last few years. they have been a thorn in the Rattlers' side. Maurice Hurd finding Rattlers everywhere. He was in a prior patch back there. Thorns all around. Just threw it out of bounds. Georgia Southern, speaking of Georgia Southern, they have a fine quarterback also who's, who's got a lot of game experience, went to the national championship. He's a speedy kid, he can throw, he can run. Rattlers are going to have to defense that option. The true test of defending the triple option. Maurice Hurd and his Golden Tiger teammates will have a week to get ready for Miles College, who they'll host when Jim Martin's team returns to Tuskegee. Second down and 10. Hurd, look out. He stumbled inside the 10 yard line. He tripped over the feet of his center and senior center, Madison Johnson. It's fourth down, or third down, rather. That's the. Oh, I think you agree, old Big Jim doesn't really have anything to hold his head down about. I mean, he played a, a better ball club here tonight, but I think they'll be contenders in the SIAC. That may be credited as a sack for uh, Florida A&M, Al. If it is, it'll be the fourth. <laughs> Jeff Patton putting a frown on that man's face. Patton, a freshman from Winston-Salem, 220-pounder. Mason Wilson carries, get this, for the 18th time this evening. 18 carries, 69 yards for a gutty junior, a 215-pounder. He's shown us something. You can see the fatigue on his face. He's had a, a hard day today. He's been tapped and kissed on and off the field. <laughs> yeah. The Rattlers were very stingy tonight. Here's Keith Benton kicking out of his own end zone. Angling it for the sideline, or from Huckabee, and it bounces right up to him. He touches it, and it'll be recovered by Tuskegee. The first time Huckabee touches the football, he turns it over. On a punt. Just got a mad hop out of it. Frustrated, he probably did not Want to let the whole evening go by without an opportunity to return one. And Ernest Jenkins, the freshman number 49, fell on it. You see him touching it inadvertently. Yeah. And Uncle B is excited about uh, having an opportunity maybe to return a punt. And goes out and uh, tries to scoop it up. Got a bad bounce. And uh, it was recovered by Tuskegee. I promise you that... Mr. Huckabee will bust one for that NCAA record this year. Bring one all the way back. Third. Sandwiched and dropped. Sack number five. Five sacks. 41 points offensively. An armada of ball carriers and receivers. Three quarterbacks. And a halftime performance that is second to none, and was second to none tonight by the Marching 100. Earl Bruce Rams played well in his debut. Colorado State visiting Knoxville, 17-14. Tennessee wins its season opener. You recall a year ago, the ball started off 0-6 and, and then won their last five. Maurice Wilson makes the grab, comes across the 45 up to the 47-yard line. Antoine Bennett. And the staff with 10 seconds to go. This one will belong to the home flow. Florida A&M has beaten Tuskegee. The Rattlers 1-0. Tuskegee drops its season opener. Before a crowd of 20,000 folks here in Tallahassee, head coach Ken Riley picks up the victory. His 19th at his alma mater. Athletic director and head coach Jim Martin of Tuskegee has absolutely nothing to be ashamed of for his team, a division lower than Florida A&M, played gallantly in a losing effort. 
Your final here as Ken Riley joins his ball club in the line. As we join you back in Bragg Stadium, which is one happy place. And Al, uh, your alma mater distinguished itself after a sluggish start. They come back and play well. They got off to a real slow start, but uh, I think Coach, Coach Riley and the staff got to be pleased with the way the team played the second half and can look forward to a, a good season. I think uh, tonight set the tone and uh, everybody got a chance to play. A lot of kids carried the ball. A lot of boys uh, got a chance to catch the football. Three quarterbacks played. He's got to feel good about it. He yeah, had to feel good, too, even in a losing effort, the way that Maurice Hurd, the fine quarterback at uh, Tuskegee, hung in there. And late in the game, he will find Christopher Holder on this rather dramatic touchdown strike. Chris Holder is a fine receiver. He had an excellent night. He ate our man-to-man -man defense alive, and uh, he's just a fine receiver. Just to be a sophomore, he's, he's showing signs of greatness already. And for Florida A&M, late in the ball game, here is a Jackson with the second of two touchdown strikes, rather the second of three that he would throw. Rod Jackson uh, fundamentally was sound tonight. He got his shoulder squared on those passes rolling to the left and did such a super job. Rod is uh, from Jacksonville, and I personally know him and have worked out with him, and I'm sure he's real pleased with his performance tonight. If you're Ken Riley, suggestions, observations on what he'll tell his ball club? Probably to maintain your, your composure. Uh, let's reload and, uh, and fasten the straps. <laughs> Chin straps tighten. Uh, next week, is, uh, we got our heads uh, ready to roll against Georgia Southern in a couple weeks. Al Chester, I enjoyed working with you, you former Florida A&M All-American. We've had a good night. I really appreciate the opportunity and hope we can do it again real soon. And walking around campus with this guy was like being in Memphis with Elvis. <laughs> we have enjoyed it here at Bragg Stadium. 41 to 9, your final here this evening on opening night on the campus of Florida A&M. We'll remind you, women's volleyball comes your way Tuesday evening, September 12th. The Lady Seminoles and the Lady Gators from Tully Gym in Tallahassee. Now stay tuned here on Sunshine Network. Coming up in just a moment, the Wildcats of Bethune Cookman and head coach Larry Little take on Gene McDowell's Knights of Central Florida. We hope you've enjoyed our telecast this evening. We'd love bringing it to you. The executive producer of the Sunshine Network, Dave Olmsted, Tom Hastings, heading the troops here this evening. From all of us on this warm September evening, from the capital city of Tallahassee. Good evening, everyone.